individuals, uh, people who say that the CERB just doesn't help them, university students, for instance, uh, who are usually lining up for jobs at this time of year. I should I should tell you that the, it did start to open up, the, obviously, the application process for the CERB on Monday. And dozens and dozens of you have told me, at least on Twitter, that you've already received your $2,000 in your bank accounts this morning. So the process does seem to be working, and of course, many of you continue to apply. We've also learned that Federal Finance Minister Bill Morneau and other ministers will hold a news conference in a couple hours from now, and there they will discuss potential changes to the government's wage subsidy bill, and we'll bring you that news conference too. That's at 1.30 Eastern. All right, let me bring in my colleagues, the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellas and CBC's David Cochran from our Parliamentary Bureau. Good to see you both this morning. Um, so we are, th this, this will be significant, uh, hopefully, for students today, uh, Vashi, because they, many of them, uh, have been talking about how they feel they are, you know, in a difficult position, not being able to get work, and maybe didn't work through the school year, and need to start accumulating some money for tuition in the fall. Yeah, exactly. And even if they did work during the school year, they didn't make exactly $5,000, let's say, which is the criteria for accessing this CERB. And then you have to go to no income now. So many of them had been counting, as you rightly point out, Rosie, on the money from this summer in order to pay for their tuition, pay for whatever they need to next year. I have heard, I know you have heard, CBC has heard from tons of students who feel like they have gone unaddressed thus far. My understanding of what the government is set to, or what the Prime Minister, rather, is set to announce today is almost a retooling of the Canada Summer Jobs Program aimed at matching students who would be looking for work with industries that need to hire people. So yeah. essential services, for example. Um, apparently, it's in the tens of thousands, the number of students who might be able to access that kind of job. So that's what I'm anticipating. And that does address a portion of the gaps that were missing with the CERB. <clears throat> the other portion, though, of people who are, for example, in the gig economy, who have lost hours, who have a bit of work but haven't entirely lost their income, the Prime Minister did, at the outset of this week, promise that they would be addressed as well. But we have yet to see any details details about how, and my understanding is, those details are still being worked on, so we don't anticipate anything today. The wage subsidy uh, program will also be a big point of discussion. We heard Pierre Polyev, the finance critic for the Conservatives, earlier today. This is sort of shaping up to be uh, a more robust discussion in Parliament, I guess you could say. There seems to be some desire on the part of the Conservatives uh, and other opposition parties to hold more regular sessions of accountability, be it through question period or others. We have yet to see that legislation introduced, but our understanding is there have been been some changes to, at least at this point, the draft legislation, to better address some of the complaints that we have been hearing so frequently from businesses around the revenue requirements. They were supposed to be able to show that in this month, for example, in March, compared to March of last year, uh, the revenues were down at least 30 percent. And because of the timing of the outbreak, uh, uh, the outbreak of the pandemic, and because of the sort of restrictions on those requirements, uh, there is said to be some flexibility. Some of our colleagues are reporting some flexibility in what the government is about to introduce the Conservatives and other opposition parties are asking for even more flexibility. So that is something to keep our eye on as well. Yeah, also interesting this morning that Air Canada announced it was going to be allowed to use the wage subsidy program to uh, keep, I think it's 36,000 employees on its payroll, which is interesting given the, the, the struggling nature of the um, airline industry right now. David, over to you on, on what you're expecting or what you're hearing. Yeah, to build on what Vashi said about the flexibility, uh, details of this were first reported, some by the Globe and Mail, some by the Toronto Star, but we've confirmed uh, now independently what the, the, our, our colleagues uh, Bill Curry and Alex Ballingall reported. Uh, to make it easier for people to qualify in March, they only need to show a revenue drop of 15% to get the wage subsidy because where this the, the lockdowns and the structures really started around the midpoint of the month. Uh, it's unfair, they felt, to, to, to have the 30% hurdle, but that will apply for April and May. And also, if you don't have a last May, because some companies could have started, or sorry, last March, some companies could have started up after that. Sure. Uh, you can compare your revenue to January and February as the benchmark for the drop. So these are things that they've done there, as well as uh, allowing a cash accounting method versus an accrual accounting method to demonstrate your revenue drop that should capture more companies. Uh, for the wage subsidy and will be a help. Uh, already Dan Kelly from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business is praising this as a positive step forward. There are obviously concerns that it doesn't quite go far enough because when you make policy this big, this fast, uh, there's going to be problems uncovered. Now, I'll just give you one example. Uh, when this wage subsidy was first rolled out, I interviewed a guy named Stephen Lee, who's a, a restaurant owner in, in, in St. John's back home, and his restaurant opened last August, so it had no March to compare mm -hmm, it to. Mm -hmm. 
So January, February sounds great as a comparison point, but what was going on in St. John's in January and February? About a million feet of snow fell on the place, so everybody right. was shut down in January right. and February. So this just shows you there are localized individual circumstances sure. where every time you try to fix something, there becomes another issue that you stumble across. So this is movement. The legislation is still in the hands of the opposition parties. They're still negotiating. We heard Pierre Polyev saying they want tax refunds, broader uh, application of the wage subsidy to make it even easier for businesses to qualify. And, and perhaps more importantly, Rosie, they want it fast because mm -hmm. to this point, the corporate sector of Canada, small, medium, large, they haven't been getting any money. CRE, CERB is working fast. Mm -hmm. This, not so quick. Yeah, and I will just go say back on the CERB point, uh, because uh, some of you asked the question, if you, if you had uh, qualified for employment insurance or you had sent in an application for employment insurance after March 15th, you were automatically moved over to the CERB. So what you see in your bank account um, within three days, uh, it will be the CERB and not EI, although there are some reports that people are getting both. I would guess that you're probably not going to get to keep all of that, so uh, just be cautious. But but uh, from a logistical perspective, it does seem to be working. Okay, I'm going to leave both of you as we wait for the Prime Minister. I believe now that we have our, our first guest, and it is the Premier of British Columbia, John Horgan, uh, where there are some signs of hope in that province. Good to see you, Premier. Thank you for making the time. Good morning, Rosemary. Um, so, Premier, how, how is the province doing right now? Because we keep hearing these uh, stories of glimmer of hope, maybe turning a corner. How would you characterize it? Well, we're very optimistic. Uh, we've seen a decline in uh, the growth of cases. We've seen a reduction in the number of hospitalizations, a reduction in the number of ICU patients. So these are all good indications, but we're far from out of the woods yet. We've had uh, direction from our public health officials that we need to stay the course. And with the weekend coming up, good weather, we're concerned about uh, physical distancing and we're gonna keep pushing those issues. But uh, so far, so good in BC. What do you think has made the difference? Because there was a point in time where it seemed like the cases were rising very quickly in British Columbia. And now it seems as though Ontario and Quebec are the ones struggling. So what measures made the real difference in your province? Well, I think we were fortunate, uh, Rosemary, in that uh, we had an outstanding public health response. Uh, my minister, Adrian Dix, uh, brought these issues to cabinet back in January. Uh, we had uh, the uh, Lunar New Year celebrations in Vancouver, which are extremely large year after year. A fraction of the people showed up because of concerns of, uh, of the virus coming from China. We have not had a confirmed case from China since Valentine's Day. So we have seen a growth of cases from uh, community transmission. We had a, a significant outbreak in Washington State as well in, in late, um, late February, which really focused the minds of British Columbians. It was right at hand, just across the 49th parallel. So people rallied to the call to action. They rallied to uh, the staying at home edicts that were given by public health officials. And as a result of that, we've seen a positive outcome. But uh, as Dr. Henry said yesterday, a little bit of good luck and a little bit of beginning this process before other provinces puts us in a pretty good position today. You, you did have some criticism around uh, the border issue when you're right, that outbreak happened. Um, and and you were concerned that the the decision to make uh, Americans exempt from crossing uh, was going to lead to further problems for your province. And, and I know that just last week, your government also expressed concerns that Canadians being repatriated, of which there are thousands, uh, were just being told yeah. to quarantine and weren't being screened. Have, have you managed to push that forward in any way with the government? We have, and uh, we'll be making an announcement later in the day. Uh, the province is going to step in and, and fill some of the gaps uh, the federal government is not able to fill at this time. But I, I, I wouldn't offer criticism on that. Uh, we've been persistent and, and constant in our message about the need to ensure that we're not introducing new cases into British Columbia. Uh, we're going to be making an announcement later in the day about uh, YVR, the airport in Vancouver, and some of the border crossings to the south. Uh, and that's been in, in concert with the federal government. Christian Freeland and I uh, talk daily. Uh, the, the level of cooperation has been positive, but we're, we're writing this as we go, as you know. Sure. So uh, I'm optimistic that we'll have a good announcement today and then more to come. Without you having to preempt yourself, uh, do you mean that you will be screening people who are coming in from uh, repatriated flights or elsewhere? 
we want to make sure that everyone has a uh, plan to self-isolate. Not just, yeah, I'll do that, but a plan. And right. we're going to have a significant form. Uh, as you know, if you've traveled internationally, you've always got to fill something out. That's usually a small document. It'll be a larger document coming into British Columbia. Uh, I expect uh, Minister Freeland will be uh, working in the same vein with Ontario and Quebec. Uh, we'll be leading the way here in BC because we've been persistent about this, but the federal government clearly recognizes this as a challenge and they're working with us to resolve the issue. So uh, I, I wish we had done it a week ago, but uh, you know, we can always say in hindsight that we could have done better. As I say, we're writing this as we go. The level of cooperation has been unprecedented. And I have to say my colleagues, uh, premiers across the country, you know the, the political cleavages between um, various provinces and various political alignments in our, in our uh, provinces across the country have all been washed away and we're working cooperatively focused on results for Canadians and, and it's really quite inspiring to participate in. I'm, I'm, I'm honoured and humbled to have that, a role in this at this point in time but it is a significant challenge but we won't get through this unless the public is with us. So far so good. Well, well that, that is encouraging, and you're always glad to hear people collaborating in moments like this. I, I want to ask you about long-term yeah. care homes, because in, in this province, in Ontario, they still have not put in place a measure that, that you, your province put in place, I think, pretty early on, where a worker was not allowed to work in more than one place. How significant a public health measure do you think, or are you told that actually was? Well, it's very, very significant and there's a whole bunch of reasons why we, our, our long-term care sector here in British Columbia has a, uh, a workforce that has to work in two and three homes. We want to take steps to reverse that. This was policy from previous governments going back a decade and a half. Uh, this is an opportunity to correct that. We've seen the results now in, a, in of course, a tragic pandemic environment of that policy, but we've been taking steps to reduce the number of interactions with uh, care aides and, and other healthcare workers from home to home. But we've had significant outbreaks. The, the majority of the deaths, re regrettably 43 fatalities in British Columbia, have been in care homes. It's obvious that that's a place we need to focus our attention. Again, we got on that early. Uh, I encouraged my colleagues at the C Council of Federation to follow suit, and many of them have. Um, your, your provincial health officer, Dr. Bonner Henry, who's become a bit, a bit of a celebrity in this, in this country, um, she yeah. has, though, when she's doing her modeling, she's done one uh, forecast or projection, she's going to do another, but she's been very resistant on the idea of putting fatalities um, on any kind of chart, the yeah. way we've seen in Ontario and in Quebec with some reticence. Are you going to ask her to do that? Is there pressure for, for, the, for you guys to release those kinds of numbers? Well, I, I, have, I don't feel any pressure to do that, and I um, have complete confidence in Dr. Henry. The objective in my mind and in her mind of the modeling is to prepare our acute care system to address illness. It's not to, uh, to give counts of potential fatalities, it's to prepare for the volume of people who will be coming into the system. That's the, the modeling helps us determine how much PPE we need, it determine how many uh, ventilators we need, do we have enough space in the, the various health authorities in British Columbia in the event of a crush. And we've seen the, that the curve is starting to bend here in BC. Uh, we're very encouraged by that. But uh, I don't believe there's any, any value in further uh, frightening British Columbians. We need to use that modeling for practical reasons, and that is to make sure that our system is prepared. And, and that's what the uh, essence of the modeling has been in BC, and that's what it'll continue to be. You, you, uh, th this, this hope, this optimism that you have and Dr. Henry has, uh, at the beginning at least of the curve flattening, are you concerned that, that people are going to read that the wrong way and, and sort of be a little bit more or too relaxed about physical distancing and other measures? I am concerned about that and as uh, the weather is spectacular here in uh, southern British Columbia today, it's forecast to be great through the, the uh, Easter long weekend. We're concerned that British Columbians will take too much uh, heart from the positive indications we've seen and, and they will lay, uh, lighten up on their activities uh, to isolate. We need to focus on that. We're going to be making significant announcements over the next number of days to encourage people to stay home, to encourage people to stay the course. We are 100% committed to each other. We need to be committed to our health care workers. And the only way we're going to get back to a sense of normalcy is if we continue to follow the guidelines that have been put in place by Dr. Henry. Even on the sunny days in British Columbia, we need to focus on staying away from other people, washing our hands, making sure that if we don't have to be outside, we're not outside.
I'm just waiting for the Prime Minister. I only have about maybe a minute, Premier. H how are you holding up? Because th it's a lot for everyone to sort of manage. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fi I mean, I'm fine. As I said, it's a, it's a real honour and a privilege to be in a position to affect positive change. People get involved in public life for these types. I mean, you don't, you don't plan for a pandemic. You mm -hmm. don't plan for uh, the challenges we've faced uh, in BC over the past number of years, the, the worst ever fire seasons, successive fire seasons, floods, now pestilence. I'm, I'm waiting for the frogs to come next. Uh, <laughs> it's been a challenge, but yeah. I'm inspired by the public service in BC. I'm inspired by the people are, who are so resilient. I mean, uh, if just the fire season in 2017 was bad enough, a, a, a worse season in 2018, floods last year, blockages in the rivers for salmon. These are the challenges, as uh, Harold McMillan said, events, dear boy, that's what government is all about. You can have the best plans in the world, but you have to deal with the here and the now. And I'm very proud of the people of BC, how we've responded. And indeed, right across the country, it is really something to see people from d different political perspectives, different regions, putting aside all of those historic grievances that we as Canadians have with each other to focus on how we can come out of this better off at the end of the day. That's good news for everybody. Okay, Premier Hor Horgan, very good of you to make the time and of course uh, wishing the province all the best as you continue to flatten the curve and everyone stay healthy out there. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Have okay. a good day. You too. That's BC Premier John Horgan in Victoria. And as he mentioned there, later today, he will make an announcement around some further screening measures for people coming into his province because uh, British Columbia is the province that is having some success in, as you heard there, flattening the curve. Part of that uh, to do with some of the early public health measures they took, but part of it to do to the increased screening that they, that they uh, put in place compared to some other provinces. Here now, the Prime Minister of Canada. Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning, Hello, everyone. everyone. Happy International Day of Pink. Today we wear pink to stand up to bullying and support those facing discrimination. If you feel alone, if you're anxious or scared, know that we're here with you today and every day. Now I want to begin this morning by addressing Canada's Jewish community. Tonight at sundown marks the beginning of Passover. Usually, this is a time for family and friends to gather around the Seder table. But tonight will truly not be like all other nights. I know staying in tonight and not gathering extended family will be hard, but it's the best way to keep yourselves and your loved ones safe. I hope you still find a way to connect with family and friends, whether it be on the phone or through video chat. To all those celebrating Passover, Chag, Pesach Sameach. Over the past few weeks, we've all had to make changes because of this pandemic. Staying indoors as much as possible and not seeing friends and family is a big adjustment for everyone, but it's especially hard for some people. If you've lost your job, if you work in an industry that's been hit hard by this virus, you're worried about your family and your future. What makes the situation so difficult is how quickly it all happened. Through no fault of your own, your whole world has been turned upside down in a matter of weeks, and that can create even more uncertainty and even more anxiety. So we've brought in a whole range of new measures to help families and workers, seniors and business owners get through this. We've put in place a three-point economic plan. It supports business owners, including through new loans, while helping those who no longer have a paycheck through the CERB and protecting jobs with the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. I know many of you are anxious to see this subsidy delivered. We're calling on the opposition to join us in bringing the House back to le pass legislation so you can get the support you need as soon as possible. Canada, that cabinet will be meeting this afternoon. As usual, most cabinet members will be on the phone and I will be intending this one in person to discuss next steps. Since we announced the wage subsidy, we've had a great many conversations with business people, unions and workers. I want to thank them for their advice and their viewpoints. These conversations have helped us to adjust what we initially announced in order to include more businesses 
and help more people. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. We said that businesses had to demonstrate that their revenue had dropped by 30% this month compared to the last year in order to receive the subsidy. We recognize that for nonprofit organizations and fast growth companies, that could present a problem. So we are going to relax those conditions. First of all, businesses will have to show a decline of 15% in their revenue for the month of March rather than 30% in order to consider the fact that the pandemic has had an impact on their activities in March. Businesses will also be able to choose to use the month of January and February as the reference period to show a loss of revenue. With respect to charities and nonprofits, we understand that you are facing a different reality when it comes to funding. For that reason, you will have a choice. You can include or exclude the government subsidy when you calculate your loss of revenue. If your business is affected by COVID-19, the government will give you up to $847 a week for every employee. And as we already announced, that subsidy will be retroactive to March 15th. Since we announced the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, We've had a number of conversations with stakeholders and workers who've provided us with valuable feedback and helped us refine what we'd put forward. I want to thank them for their input. We want to make these emergency measures as effective and inclusive as we can, so we're listening and making adjustments along the way. We previously, previously announced that to qualify for the subsidy, businesses would have to show a 30% drop in revenues when comparing the month this year to the month the previous year. We recognize that this could be an issue for nonprofits, fast -growing, company, growing companies like startups, and new businesses. So we're going to put in place more flexible rules. Companies will now have the option of using January and February of this year as reference points to show a 30% loss. And businesses will only need to show a 15% decline in revenue for March instead of 30% because most of us only felt the impact of COVID-19 about halfway through the month. We understand that charities and nonprofits are experiencing different types of pressures when it comes to funding. For this reason, they will have the choice to include or exclude government funding when calculating loss in revenue. If your company or organization has been impacted by COVID-19, the government will give you up to $847 a week per employee. And as we've said before, this subsidy will be retroactive to March 15th. Our government understands that not all businesses operate the same way, and that's why we're making changes to include as many of you as possible. We will keep listening but we really hope you will use this help from your country and from your fellow citizens to rehire and pay your workers. If our economy is to get through this, we need businesses to survive and workers to get paid. Job numbers for March will be out tomorrow. And it's going to be a hard day for the country. We're facing a unique challenge, but I know that if we pull together, our economy will come roaring back after this crisis. In recent weeks, we introduced unprecedented measures, including the emergency wage subsidy and the Canada emergency benefit to help workers, families and businesses. Having said that, some people are not eligible to the benefits we put in place. They need additional support. I'm thinking of gig workers or people who provide home care or who people whose work hours are 10 hours or less a week. We are currently looking for solutions and we will help you. Our seniors are also going through a very difficult period these days because they are particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. At the same time, they're concerned about the impact of the economic decline on their savings and other consequences of the crisis. We will have additional measures to put in place to help the most vulnerable Canadians. Now, when it comes to students and young people who are preparing to enter the job market, we will have a number 
number of measures to help you as well. This morning, we're starting with the first step. people and small businesses affected by COVID-19, we're making changes to the Canada Summer Jobs Program this year. We will now give CSJ employers a subsidy of up to 100% to cover the costs of hiring students. We will also extend the time frame for job placement until the winter because we know that some jobs will start later than usual. And because many businesses have had to scale back their operations, they will be able to hire students part-time. Our government is also encouraging all employers who have been impacted by COVID-19 to make adjustments so work can continue. For example, if you run a local food bank, you may be doing deliveries instead of serving people on site so you could hire students to help you. We will also be asking MPs across the country to reach out to businesses and organizations providing critical services in their communities to look at how students can help during this critical time. In this economic climate, it's hard for people of all ages to find work, but young people are especially vulnerable. They're new to the workforce, so they don't have a lot of money set aside for this kind of situation. At the same time, they need work experience to secure their next job and money to cover their living expenses and help with tuition for the rest of the year. Today, we're taking a step in the right direction to help young people find work during this difficult time, but I want to be clear we will be doing more. Just like we will do more for those who need help but are not eligible to receive the benefits we've announced so far. We're also working around the clock to ensure that our frontline workers have everything they need to save lives and stay safe. Overnight, we received a half a million N95 masks from 3N, 3M, and they'll be distributed across the country where they are most needed. I know the past weeks haven't been easy, but we're going to get through this together if everyone keeps following the instructions from public health experts. So please stay home as much as possible. Only go out for essential things like groceries and medications and try to make that trip once a week or less. And when you do, remember to keep two meters from those around you. That's the best way to stay healthy and protect our frontline workers who are doing so much to help all of us. Encore une fois, merci avec Once nous again, ce matin. thank you for Je joining us this morning. I'm now pleased to take your media question. Thank you, Prime Minister. We'll now go to the phones for one question, one follow up. Over to you, Operator. Merci, thank you. The first question is from Heather Scofield from the Toronto Star. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Good morning, Prime Minister. Could you talk to us about what your plan is to get people back to work efficiently and safely without provoking another outbreak? Uh, what we're seeing around the world is countries are beginning as uh, we see social distancing measures, as we see people staying home uh, in countries around the world, uh, are now looking at the steps needed to think about easing those social distancing rules to start our economies rolling again. It is very obvious that we need to be very, very careful that all the work we've done uh, over these past weeks and in the coming weeks at staying home, at uh, following the instructions of our public health officials, doesn't become for naught uh, when suddenly uh, spikes happen as we get back to work. So it's going to be very, very important uh, to do it in a measured, graduated way that allows for economic activity to begin uh, while uh, preventing uh, severe spikes in uh, COVID transmission. Uh, there is uh, a lot of reflections ongoing on that, but as we know, uh, the current measures will be in place for many more weeks, uh, so we have time to get that right and to look what other countries that might be earlier uh, in their phase uh, do that is successful or less. And, and just to follow up on that, I mean, it, it seems that we do have, have some time to think about it, um, but there's also, uh, how do you assess the risk of, of summertime? I mean, we've been cooped up already for, for four weeks and people are doing it voluntarily um, and, and, as you say, working very well together. Um, but how, 
what's the risk of that falling apart as the summertime comes and, and the good weather is there and people are you know, in desperate need of, of, of some earnings as well? We will be talking about modeling in the coming days uh, and what various scenarios are, but what is very, very clear is in order to av avoid uh, spiking cases, in order to avoid uh, having to stay in uh, reduced economic activity modes for uh, months and months and months and months and months, uh, we need to keep very, very strong in the measures we have now. That is how we get to the best case scenario. And quite frankly, the social distancing and the staying home that Canadians are doing now uh, is uh, being, you know, exact, is exactly the right kinds of things that we need in order to look at the most optimistic models. There is no question that once we uh, start to get to the other side of this spike and are able to talk about uh, easing off social distancing, um, there will be a need for continual surveillance, continual attentiveness on testing, on contact tracing, on uh, protecting our most vulnerable. Uh, that means uh, even as uh, things are able to start getting back to normal, uh, they won't be back to normal. And calibrating that right and understanding that what people are doing now is essential, what they will continue doing now is just as, uh, in the coming weeks is just as essential, but how we ease off and continue to follow the best directions and instructions of our public health officials will be how we manage uh, to get through this in the best possible way. Okay. We recognize that it's difficult to uh, remain in isolation or remain home during this period. And we know that we're going to have to continue to do that for many weeks to come. But in order to have the best possible chance of coming out of this as quickly as possible and as healthy as possible, we must uh, continue to comply with those recommendations that are keeping us safe. At some point, in a few months probably, when we are easing some of the measures, we will have to continue to be very vigilant about our own behavior uh, in returning to work to ensure that we won't be facing a new epidemic or even worse, that everything we will have done in these past weeks uh, will have been for nothing and will have a major problem in the country. So we are looking very carefully carefully at how we can move on to the next phase, but there is no doubt that uh, we are still uh, in the midst of this phase, which means you have to stay at home as much as possible and continue to maintain the proper distance from others. Next question, please. Merci, thank you. The next question is from Elfia Raj, HuffPost Canada. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Um, can you explain why the government chose not to make relief payments simple, inclusive, and universal? You know, we're hearing from a lot of people who are excluded from the measures that you've announced, including the ones this week, for a variety of reasons. Now, one of your MPs is telling people who have some income not to take the attestation for the Canada Emergency Relief Benefit so literally. There's another expert telling self-employed workers not to invoice for 14 days in order to qualify, which to me sounds pretty unethical. Why did you decide against, for example, sending $2,000 payments to all Canadians and to claw them back from those who don't need them next year? We recognize that uh, we need to do, we needed to do things quickly and we needed to do things robustly uh, in a way that uh, would allow our extraordinary public servants at uh, Canada Revenue Agency and elsewhere to be able to put in a system uh, that would reach uh, the largest number of Canadians who needed it as possible. We looked at many different designs and we even iterated in the designs that we put forward, uh, but we established that the Canada Emergency Response Benefit uh, was a way of replacing income uh, to the largest number of people who uh, suddenly found themselves without a paycheck and that the wage subsidy uh, at 75% uh, was going to be able to keep people connected to their jobs uh, and uh, ensure that businesses continued to uh, 
uh, to exist so that they can come back quickly afterwards. We recognize that any time you put out large measure, measures uh, quickly and, and uh, in a way that is uh, solid enough to be um, certain that it's going to work through the machine, uh, there are going to be gaps. And what we've talked about over these past days is ways of uh, filling those gaps and making sure that more people who are in uh, exceptional or different circumstances are able to access the help we need. And we will continue to have more to say on that uh, in the coming days. When we're trying to help as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, you obviously have to introduce very broad measures that are at the same time robust because we want to be able to deliver those benefits to as many people as uh, possible as part of a system that was not actually created to operate that quickly and as broadly. So that's the choice that we made with uh, the supplement for workers, but we also know that there are people, even though millions of people will be receiving the Bennett, we know there are people in particular circumstances who will not qualify for that progr program. And that's why we're constantly refining the measures to try and find ways to give help uh, to people who need that help. We realize that we can't have a perfect system in this kind of unprecedented situation. We are not aiming for perfection. We're trying to help as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And that's why we're constantly announcing new measures to help more people. But with yeah, but with respect, if your goal is to help the widest number of people to make this as broad as possible, and you're defending it by saying that you needed to have big, bold action. Wouldn't the big, bold action be to send everybody help as opposed to rolling out week by week uh, new changes, revised versions of programs in order to fix the gaps that uh, apparently are just coming to the government's attention? That way you wouldn't have people who maybe, you know, six, seven, eight weeks without any income at all? We knew from the very beginning uh, that we had to make a choice, whether we get uh, big programs out quickly to as many people as possible, or else uh, we figure out how to refine them and get the right things to people. Um, we made uh, a, a, a double process, a, a, a two-program process writ large, uh, where yes, millions of Canadians will receive the $2,000 uh, every month with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. But we also know uh, that there are many Canadians uh, who are middle, middle class, uh, who, uh, for whom $2,000 a month uh, might not be even nearly enough to cover their needs uh, right now because of various costs, because of various issues that they're facing, uh, which is why we wanted to bring in a 75% wage subsidy that will give them, instead of just five $500 a week up to $847 a week. Uh, that is more generous for people uh, who need it, uh, but it is still a uh, significant pay cut for everyone. We understand this is a situation that is difficult for everyone. We modeled ourselves uh, these programs on a collection of programs that worked in different ways in different countries, and we're confident that we came up with the right measures to help most Canadians. But as I said, there are people we recognize uh, need uh, particular help or don't quite fall into those categories, and that's very much what we're working on now and, and have been announcing over the past few days in terms of measures uh, that we're bringing in for people who, who work uh, less than 10 hours a week, for example, who will still qualify for the CERB. These are the kinds of things we're continuing to work on. Thank you. Next question, operator. Thank you, merci. La prochaine question est de Emily Bergeron de l'agence QMI. Votre ligne est ouverte. À vous la parole. Oui, bonjour, M. Trudeau. Good morning, um, Mr. Trudeau. La, la question de, pour la subvention salariale d'attente de trois à six semaines. Uh, to wage si je bien, and people having to wait three to six weeks. As I understand de, it, that will not long change. Long délai, Many businesses are saying that that's nous going to be too long. What do you say to them? We are working very hard to try and shorten that timeline. We're aiming for three weeks, and we hope to be able to deliver it in three weeks. Now, of 
course, we have our public servants working very, very hard to deliver the emergency benefit, and already today, millions of Can Canadians are receiving their money. It's been an extraordinary amount of work carried out uh, by uh, people who are working and concerned about their family and have continued to work in order to deliver this benefit to Canadians. And now they are going to be working on the wage subsidy. And we aim to deliver that program in three weeks, perhaps even earlier if things go according to plan. But we also know that this is a new program. This is something that's never been done uh, by a government here. And we're confident that we're going to be able to deliver it. Uh, we recognize uh, that uh, this is a significant task, uh, but we know that businesses who are making decisions to rehire are uh, stretched thin and need to know that money is going to come in soon from the government. Uh, that's why uh, we are aiming for three weeks in terms of uh, landing the wage subsidy, uh, getting it to, to uh, Canadian businesses. Uh, it will require uh, continued Herculean efforts by our public servants, particularly the Canada Revenue Agency, who have uh, done extraordinary work over these past weeks to deliver the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. And as we've seen, uh, millions of Canadians are beginning to receive that as of today. Uh, this was an unbelievable effort by uh, people who quite frankly, are facing the same challenges, the same pandemic, the same uh, family issues and worries that the rest of us are facing, but stayed focused on delivering help for Canadians because this was so important at this time. And now they are going to turn their energies and efforts towards delivering the wage subsidy, which, uh, as I said, we hope to see uh, within the next three weeks. Uh, but uh, that is something that we're going to continue uh, working on extremely hard. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we are so eager uh, to see Parliament pass the legislation necessary. And I, I'm certainly hoping, hoping that the uh, opposition parties uh, will uh, join me in moving quickly quickly to get this through so we can get help to Canadians. And Suivi? Yes, with respect to the return of Parliament, you said yesterday that the wage subsidy must be approved in the House of Commons. What is causing the delay with the opposition parties? Uh, well, we're talking about measures that represent uh, the most extensive measures ever introduced by a government in the history of this country. And we want the opposition parties to be involved in order to get this legislation passed, but also we want them to have a chance to review it and make sure that this is the right way to help Canadians. If they have questions, well, we're working with them and we hope to be able to work uh, collaboratively with them because everyone agrees that we need to get aid to Canadians and we'll be working together to see that we do it right. These measures are the largest measures passed uh, in decades, if not ever by a Canadian government. Uh, that's why our democratic institutions and our democratic processes, including parliamentary oversight, is extremely important. That's why we're working with opposition parties to ensure that this legislation gets passed quickly but properly so that we can get this help to Canadians in the best possible way. Thank you. One more call, please, operator. Next question is from Brett Forrester. APTN, your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi, Mr. Prime Minister, with uh, various First Nations calling for military assistance, at what point does the military agree to go help? Is it uh, number of cases? Is it deaths? Is it per capita? What's the threshold for answering some of these calls for help? Uh, obviously, we are very concerned uh, with the situation in uh, First Nations communities across the country. Uh, indigenous communities in general, particularly remote and northern ones, are uh, more vulnerable because uh, they often have uh, uh, difficult circumstances, including uh, difficulty around uh, health care. Uh, so uh, we recognize that as something we need to focus on. Um, decisions on how to best help, first of all, we, we've already uh, allocated millions of dollars to uh, community support programs in Indigenous 
communities. Uh, as for further assistance or military assistance, that will always be made on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, depending on the individual circumstances and how uh, we can best help as a government. Uh, that is what we're go always going to be looking at. And a follow-up? Yep, thank you. As a follow-up, uh, we know, uh, as you say, these communities really are petri dishes. And for example, Yabamatong and, uh, and the uh, Anishinaabe Aski Nation Grand Chief have been asking for other resources in view of of military aid. What's your response to some of their calls to action? Uh, my response to uh, Grand Chief Fiddler and, and others is uh, really to make sure that is to is that yes, we're there and we want to help. Uh, I know uh, Minister Miller and others have been engaging directly uh, with leadership across uh, across uh, across Canada to ensure that uh, what is needed uh, is worked on together. Uh, we recognize the particular and in some cases uh, uh, significant needs of, uh, in many cases, significant needs of Indigenous communities and that is something that we are working on together. We recognize that our indigenous communities are particularly vulnerable to COVID-19, and that's why we continue to work with them. We have made direct investments in those communities already, but there is certainly more that we can and will be doing, and we'll be working with uh, uh, the leadership, and Minister Miller is working directly with them to see what we can do to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and respond if they do have cases. Radio-Canada, you said that your wage subsidy is not perfect, but why didn't you make things more simple, simple? And why didn't you decide, instead of the CERB in its current form, just to send a check to everyone? Why didn't you make it as simple as possible so that everyone would get money and nobody would be falling between the cracks? There are a lot of people who do not qualify for EI. There are a number of systems that we looked at and different methods uh, that we examined to try and help people, and we decided that the Canada Emergency Response Benefit would be the best way to help millions of people. But as we said, there are people who only work a few hours a week who should have access to that benefit, and we are making the necessary changes to make that happen. We also know that there are other people in special circumstances, like students, who are facing real challenges in terms of getting uh, summer jobs or part-time jobs. They need that money to pay their rent and to go back to school in the fall. So that's why we are continually looking at other ways to help. But the CERB and the wage sub subsidy together will help millions and millions of Canadians and Canadian workers who are facing difficult times. But we will continue to work to help help the most vulnerable. Uh, we recognize uh, that uh, the two measures we've put forward, the wage subsidy and the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, uh, will help millions of Canadians. But at the same time, we also recognize there are uh, people who uh, will not qualify for either and who need help. That's why we've announced certain modifications already. If you're working less than 10 hours a week, um, we're, we will be uh, telling you how you can apply for the CERB. Uh, if you're a student, for example, on top of the Canada Summer Jobs Program that we talked about today, we will be bringing forward uh, more measures because we recognize that uh, without your summer job, uh, without a source of income over the coming uh, months, uh, including uh, part-time work, uh, you will have trouble paying your rent, you will have trouble paying for, uh, paying for your tuition next year. So these are the things that we're continuing to work on. We just needed to get the two big measures that would help millions of Canadians out as quickly as possible uh, and chose to uh, work on refining them later. There is always a fundamental choice to make in a crisis around whether you want to move fast uh, or whether you want to get everything absolutely perfect. In this case, we understood that getting help out to Canadians as quickly as possible uh, in a way that is as solid as possible was extremely important and we continually work uh, in terms of making sure we're getting people who find themselves in gaps.
Mais vous dites, M. Trudeau, vous voulez que ça soit rapide. Mais pourquoi ce n'est pas plus rapide pour les gens qui ne se qualifient pas à la prestation d'urgence pour 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 la prestation d'urgence I will be going to Parliament to, to do some work. But generally speaking, I will continue to work from here at home and on the phone. We will, I will continue uh, to work from home uh, day in and day out, as we're asking most Canadians to do. There will be moments for strategic meetings or particular issues where I will go into the office uh, for meetings, taking all proper precautions. But most of my work will continue to be uh, from home on the telephone. Marika Walsh with The Globe and Mail. For the past two weeks, you've been saying that the models that Canada will release are coming in the coming days. When will they actually be released? We've seen uh, over the past few days a number of provinces putting forward uh, more data and more modeling uh, on their issues. Uh, at the federal level, we continue every single day to put forward updated numbers uh, to be fully transparent with Canadians on the national picture. But in order to have a national picture in terms of modeling and forecasts, uh, we need to draw on what the provinces are doing, what modeling work they're doing. Provinces are, have been releasing uh, this week much more information around their models. And as we collate those and look at those and integrate those into a national model, we will have more to say in the coming days. We recognize that people want to know how long this is going to last and what kind of mortality rates uh, could occur. And every day uh, we are publishing information on Canada.ca. Uh, a lot of figures are there because uh, we are trying to be transparent and prevent, uh, present information from across the country. At the same time, we know that a number of provinces did release uh, modeling and projections this week uh, with respect to the future. And if we want to present projections or modeling that is truly nationwide, we have to collate all that information and those projections from the various provinces, and we will be doing this uh, in the coming days. It's more reasonable to say that it would be in the coming weeks then at this point, and the Conservatives are calling for a uh, daily question period with the return to Parliament. Do you support that? Uh, I think it's extremely important that uh, Parliament continues to do its work, uh, particularly in a time of crisis. Uh, it is going to be extremely important that we gather to pass important legislation to allow uh, Canadian businesses and workers uh, to be helped by the Canada, the uh, wage subsidy. Uh, these are things that we're gathering for and working together on. Uh, I think that uh, as we asked the Speaker a number of days ago, uh, we should look at gathering uh, a virtual Parliament I think it's important that parliamentarians from every corner of the country, not just those within driving distance of, of Ottawa, uh, should be able to uh, weigh in on uh, the working of, of our democracy. That's why we're looking at virtual models for doing that. Uh, in terms of my own engagement, I'm happy to take questions every day and I'm happy to work with parliamentarians to, uh, as I take questions every day as I do uh, here uh, from media, uh, but I'm also happy to work with parliamentarians to make sure that we're continuing to get accountability uh, and get the measures right for Canadians. Uh, I believe deeply in our democratic institutions, particularly in a time of crisis, and I look forward to continuing to work with all opposition parties uh, to make sure that uh, we have working systems in place. Okay. Uh, we know just how important it is to have a properly functioning parliament and to have institutions working in a time of crisis. So we will be recalling parliament in the coming days to pass legislation to help uh, workers through the wage subsidy. And uh, a number of days ago, we asked the Speaker of the House of Commons to look at uh, virtual ways of recalling Parliament. 
because I don't think it's entirely fair that only parliamentarians who are able to come because they live close to Ottawa participate, can participate in our discussions. And we want to look at ways of engaging all parliamentarians, and we're uh, talking about this with the other opposition parties. I'm very happy to take questions from the media, and I'm happy to take questions regularly from the other parties, and we continue our discussions on this. Um, I know you're going to be talking about uh, your modeling in the coming days, but from what you've seen, do you have any idea when the virus is going to peak nationally? And also, are you concerned about the virus coming in waves so that Canadians are going to be dealing with this for, for many months? Uh, excellent question, Tom. I think uh, we are very much trying to figure out uh, where we are on the very on the curve uh, within the various models. Uh, what is very, very clear is there are significant differences across the country in uh, where various provinces are on their own curves. Uh, overall, as a country, I can say we we have uh, reached the point where we are later than many other countries. So we have a glimpse into what is effective and what is working to bend those curves in other countries that we are doing now. Our social distancing over the past weeks and staying at home has been very effective. And regardless of the model in place, it is clear that the best outcomes come when there is maximal social distancing, as uh, we are pretty close to doing right now, as uh, we ramp up testing, because that's an important piece of it, and we're continuing to do more testing every single day, um, and as we do aggressive contact tracing uh, to ensure that people who are uh, possibly exposed uh, are put uh, into self-isolation. These kinds of things are what give us the best chance of getting there. We don't know exactly when we're going to be peaking, but we do know if we continue to do this, if we continue to keep uh, the measures in place that we have right now, we will get through this much, much quicker. Once we are through this uh, initial phase, uh, we will then be in a uh, mode until there is a vaccine, which could take uh, many, many months, if not uh, more than a year to get to. We will be um, calibrating very carefully our behaviors as uh, a country, as a society, as an economy, uh, to uh, managing uh, the existence and persistence of COVID-19. Um, better testing, uh, careful uh, isolation of vulnerable communities, uh, measures of gradually bringing back the economy will come. So if there are spikes, as uh, the data and, and documentation uh, tells us that we can expect, we are quickly able to adjust and react. So none of those spikes over the coming many months that are possible uh, will be anything as serious as this one. Uh, but in order to do that, we have to keep following medical advice, knowing that what Canadians are doing right now, staying home, keeping two meters apart, not going out unless you absolutely have to, is what is getting us through this and will ensure that, uh, that Canadians are kept as safe as possible and our economy comes back as quickly and as strongly as possible. So let's keep doing what we're doing. Just sur quel, quel aspect? Le pic, le pic. Le pic, oui. Uh, nous, uh, nous savons que les mesures we know que nous that train, the uh, measures uh, that uh, we're following uh, now are the correct measures. We saw this in other countries uh, de, de that are further ahead pandémie, than we are uh, in terms of the evolution of the pandemic. And we saw that these measures are the best way to reduce the impact cette, uh, and uh, the duration of this pandemic. We will continue. Uh, to introduce or to follow these controls that we put in place. We don't know exactly when the peak will occur, but if we stay the course now, that can make a big difference. And in the months and year to come, after we come through this initial phase, there could be a resurgence of the virus here and there in Canada. But uh, I hope that we will be in a position to better control uh, the spread if there are small outbreaks uh, at 
that point uh, in various places. So it's, uh, that's what we're working on right now, and we expect to share our projections in the coming days. National News. Uh, as you spoke about the importance of testing for these models and numbers we're talking about, are you at all concerned that Canada's most populous province is the lowest per capita rate in terms of testing, but also, according to reports, is falling well short of, the, of Ontario's own testing goals? So what more can the federal government do? Why hasn't the federal government stepped in to increase testing in Ontario and in other provinces? We're working very closely with all provincial health authorities to ensure that they have uh, the equipment and the ability uh, to do as many tests as possible. Uh, this is an essential part of getting through this phase of the pandemic and indeed uh, keeping us out of further phase or, or minimizing further phases of the pandemic uh, over the coming many months. Uh, we continually do more testing uh, every single day in this country. Uh, we're already doing better than uh, most, uh, than many, many countries in the world uh, that we compare ourselves to. Uh, but at the same time, we recognize there's more to do. We will continue to work with jurisdictions that are facing challenges, uh, and uh, and we will uh, we will work together to make sure uh, that we're doing what is needed right across the country to keep Canadians safe. Prime Minister Janet Silver, Global News. Public Health Canada told the government in early February more resources for local public health officials were needed to contain the outbreak and enforce a quarantine order. Why did the federal government not act at that time to do more to bolster resources and to stop the spread? Uh, we recognized early on that this was a challenge, and we did take uh, many measures uh, to try and, and uh, control or prevent or ensure that uh, Canada was less vulnerable to the spread of COVID-19 that we were seeing uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, with, uh, with hindsight, I'm sure there are lots of things that we would have done differently, could have done differently, but I can tell you that every step of the way, uh, we took the advice of our medical professionals and our public health experts seriously and did as best as we could. Obviously, once this is all through, there will be many, many people uh, reflecting on different countries' uh, responses and what we need to do to ensure that we are even better prepared next time. Uh, it was uh, something we certainly did and benefited from because of the SARS outbreak uh, of uh, 2003 that allowed us uh, to have a number of measures in place that were more effective uh, than some other countries. Uh, but at the same time, there's always more to learn and more to do. And an Ipsos poll is out today for Global News that shows one quarter of Canadians report they are still not strictly following physical distancing. And cities are also logging thousands of complaints from residents about people flouting the rules. I'm just wondering, do you have any tools that you're willing to use to crack down on these people? I think one of the things that we have to recognize uh, in this situation uh, is that much of the ability of Canada and of Canadians to get through this uh, in as short amount of time as possible and as healthy as possible uh, requires citizens to be doing their part. And we see millions upon millions of Canadians following the instructions of Health Canada officials, of their public health officials, uh, in terms of social distancing, in terms of staying at home, in terms of not going out unless they actually have to, absolutely have to, uh, of uh, doing everything they can to keep our frontline workers from uh, grocery store cashiers to, uh, to uh, surgeons uh, as safe as we possibly can. These are the things that Canadians are doing. Unfortunately, we do see uh, that there are some people who are not choosing to uh, follow these instructions, and they're putting everyone else at risk. And we uh, continue to uh, impress upon everyone that we need to do uh, what is necessary to get through this as quickly and as safely as possible. We will continually work with uh, jurisdictions, with, um, with cities, with provinces uh, on uh, new measures or extra measures that they feel are necessary. Uh, as it goes, we're continually monitoring uh, what is needed and what we might need to do as next steps. Merci tout le monde. Bonne journée.
All right, and that is our daily briefing from the Prime Minister of Canada on the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we break down some of the important news he had there for Canadians, let me tell you about some other breaking news south of the border that during a regular time would be probably be the only story happening right now, and that is that Democratic uh, presidential candidate Senator Bernie Sanders has decided to suspend his campaign uh, for uh, to become the Democratic nominee for president, uh, making that decision to volunteers about 15, making that announcement rather to volunteers about 15 minutes ago saying that there is no alternative. Of course, Joe Biden, uh, his, uh, his his competitor, was seemed to be running away with the nomination, but Bernie Sanders now saying that he will suspend his campaign, which essentially means that uh, Joe Biden is all but confirmed as the Democratic nominee for president. Um, so that some major news in the United States, but uh, because of everything we're dealing with around the world, and particularly in this country, um, we will go back to the things that we we need to tell you about from the Prime Minister. We'll bring in the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellas, CBC's David Cochran from our Parliamentary Bureau. So, uh, yeah, you can see on our screen there, uh, Bernie Sanders speaking to his... There's a lot going on. There's a lot <laughs> going on. Um, let's talk about some of the things, though, that a lot of Canadians have been waiting to hear from the Prime Minister. And I will also just add this, that he will actually leave his house today to go and chair a cabinet meeting that will be held uh, in a secure room. But I would imagine much easier to hold a meeting when you were there in person, even if uh, everybody else is not there. All right, Vashi, over to you on, on what stood out there for you. Sure. So a couple of things really stood out to me, and much of what we had anticipated was in the uh, remarks that the Prime Minister made, as well as much of the many of the questions that he received. So first on the big economic programs, the wage subsidy program, as we had anticipated, at Dave, as David reported, uh, the revenue requirements are going to be relaxed. Uh, so for example, you would have had to show a 30% decline in March of this year versus March of last year. You can now actually show just a 15% decline and or you can compare it to January and February rather than last year. Uh, and then if you're a not-for-profit and you get a government mm -hmm. subsidy, you can also, this is this was new, you can also yeah. uh, decide whether you want to include it or exclude it when you're making your revenue calculations in order to figure out whether you're going to qualify for that subsidy. So that is a substantial piece of news. I would just add a caveat to that, that this will be part of legislation, that at some point, we don't know as of yet at <laughs> what point, at some point in the you know, not too distant future is going to be introduced into the House of Commons. It also will end up uh, being up for debate. There was some conversation there, some questions and answers from uh, between the Prime Minister and journalists around the timeline for that. The Conservatives would like more regular accountability, so more regular question period, uh, as well as more debate on, on pieces of legislation like this. They want it to come out faster. They want the wage subsidy to come out faster. The Prime Minister is now saying three weeks. They're hoping for three weeks instead of three to six weeks. Uh, the Prime Minister did not specifically say whether he was in favor of, for example, a daily question period. He talks about a virtual parliament, including more MPs. He says he's in favor of, you know, the function of parliament right now, but it wasn't necessarily, okay, yes, we will have mm -hmm. question period four days. The other big piece of news around students. So this is one of the big groups of Canadians who felt that they were being missed by the CERB, that they couldn't qualify for that $2,000 a month. The Prime Minister announced a change to the Canada Summer Jobs Program. So they will subsidize wages in that program for hiring students uh, up to 100%. So they will subsidize the whole wage rather than just 75%. They anticipate, their estimation is that that will create 70,000 jobs. They're also extending the period uh, all the way until February, I believe, February 28th of 2021, that those wages can be covered, an extension to the end date, rather, for employment. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is pretty substantial as well. They hope that will obviously address a big need from students, not every student. Uh, the final point I'll leave you on, Rosie, before you head over to David is, sort of one of the areas that we didn't get a lot of clarification. And this is something pushed by New Democrats so far. It folds into the CERB and, and the coverage of it. There are still a number of people who are missed by that. The Prime Minister is promising that for example, people in the gig economy who have lost most but not all of their hours most, if not all, of their income will be covered eventually. He didn't specify how. New Democrats have been saying for a while now, why didn't you just encompass everyone in the first shot? And his answer to that was that the, and I'm paraphrasing here, but that the program that they developed could get the money out fast, which to give them credit for is actually happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so they chose that over having a perfect program. I think, though, there are a number of Canadians who will be watching very closely over the coming days to find out exactly how this program will be expanded to fit them in because as of yet they are not covered by it.
Yeah, I, I, th that's a good point. I'll get David to pick up on that point because the, the Prime Minister also suggested, rightly, I think, that the wage subsidy program will actually be, uh, if companies pick it up, more advantageous to Canadians than a one-time or a, some sort of universal income that happens for the next four months. And there's also the issue that not everybody needs that money, you know. Uh, so if you just send it out everywhere, at some point you have to scale it back. I don't know what's easier and what's faster or more efficient, but uh, David, I'll let you pick up on that. Yeah, uh, this has been the, the tension on this, right? Why not just send two thousand dollars to everybody sort of what we're seeing in the united states that's what president trump has said he's in favor of doing anything it's a thousand dollars in theirs yeah. correct me if i'm wrong yep. uh and then just tax it back and get it back from people okay sounds great uh what if you're kevin milligan who's an economist uh, and, and an academic has done some work on this what if you're a essential worker who makes forty thousand dollars and you for four months get eight thousand dollars in money that next year at tax time, they're going to try to claw that back from you. Mm -hmm. Have you got that eight thousand? Did you keep it? How easy is it to repay? What are the penalties? What are the punishments? Their goal here has been to be as targeted as possible to ensure that whatever money they send out goes to people who actually need it, actually are going to rely on it, and actually require it. And that has caused some problems. There's no yeah. question about it. Yeah. It's slower to get out. There are sure. gaps in that system that need to be patched over. But there becomes a back end challenge. If you put out, say, $6,000 to people who don't need it uh, with the yeah. expectation that they're going to have to give it back. Now, you can yeah. just write it all off and give it to everybody, and you could do that. Uh, that then makes all of this become that much more expensive and eats into the fiscal firepower that they need to do things. So that's the challenge there. Uh, like the other challenge they have to get this wage subsidy up and running. I see the ministers coming in. Yeah. Just a, a, a bit of good news on that, Rosie, uh, is Air Canada is going to put 16,000 people it laid off back on payroll because of this wage subsidy. That's a big deal for these people. That's eight hundred and forty-seven dollars a month, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. or sorry, a week that they can now count on for income. That that matters. Uh, yeah, and you're, you're quite right. No system was going to be perfect. Uh, yeah. So. This is what they've chosen, and they're going to work with it for now. I did have a student on standby, but unfortunately the ministers are, are speaking, so I will uh, get to him if I can, but we'll take you now to the Deputy Prime Minister briefing uh, and public health officials speaking now. I know that all of us will overcome the current challenges together. My best wishes are with all Jewish Canadians today. La Pâque juive est une histoire de sacrifice. Passover is a story of sacrifice and salvation, which is even more relevant this year. Even though our loved ones are physically absent from the Seder table, I know that together we will overcome these challenges. Today, we are going to hear from Canada's chief public health officer, Dr. Theresa Tam. By video link, we are going to hear from the Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Disability Inclusion, Carla Qualtrough, et du Président du Conseil du Trésor, Jean-Yves Duplot. And the President of Treasury Board. Hello, everyone. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good morning, everyone. Update on the number of COVID-19 cases in Canada. There are now 18,447 cases, including 401 deaths. From the lab side, we have now completed testing for over 359,000 people in Canada, maintaining about a 5% confirmed positive rate um, to track where spread is occurring. Over the past weeks, I've highlighted our key concerns from the first travel-related cases to the onset of community spread, to cases and outbreaks in long-term care facilities, healthcare settings, and vulnerable communities. We knew from the experience of other countries that this was not going to be easy, but our health system is coping so far. Maintaining our collective resolve to plank the curve will be a challenge as the weather warms and the holidays approach. Sachant que d'importantes fêtes religieuses auront lieu bientôt, with important religious observances coming up, including Easter, Passover, Vaisakhi, and Ramadan, I must remind everyone that this is the critical time to maintain our physical distancing strategy. This means having dinners with household members only and connecting virtually over phone 
email, video chatting, etc. Tell your friends and family from the United States that this is not the time to visit Canada, as there are currently travel restrictions in place, even if travelers presenting without symptoms are permitted to enter, they will be subject to mandatory quarantine for 14 days. Online, uh, travel for celebrating with friends and family are not considered essential travel. I know this change to our traditions will be challenging to do, and I will also miss being apart from my family. But unprecedented times call for unprecedented action. observations coming up, including Easter, Passover, Vesaki, and Ramadan, I must remind everyone that this is a the critical time to maintain our physical distancing. It means having dinners with household members only and connecting virtually over phone, emails, video chatting, etc. Tell your friends and family from the United States this is not the time to visit Canada as there are currently travel restrictions in place. Even if travelers presenting without symptoms are permitted to enter, they will be subject to mandatory quarantine for 14 days. Traveling for the purpose of celebrating with your family and friends is not considered essential. I know this change to our traditions will be challenging to do, and I will miss being apart from my family too. But unprecedented times call for unprecedented action. Although many of us. All right, we will uh, pull away this from this federal briefing on CBC, the main network, right now. If you'd like to continue watching, you can, of course, do that on CBC News Network and CBC.ca. See you back here tomorrow. After entering from outside the specified now to Ottawa, area, if you are watching on the CBC safest News plan for your holidays is a staycation the for the nation. Dr. Start arranging now to make virtual connections. We need to protect each other, and that is best done by keeping physically apart but virtually together. Connecting has never been so important, so please support each other. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tam. Uh, and now we will hear from Minister Carla Qualtro. Carla, please. Hello, bonjour. I'm pleased to be able to join you today to bring two important updates. First, I'd like to update you on the latest Canada Emergency Response Benefit numbers. Yesterday, April 7th, we received just over 750,000 new CERB applications. This brings us to a total of 1.72 million for Monday and Tuesday of this week alone, and 4.26 million since March 15th. To date, we have processed 3.87 million total CERB claims. This means since March 15th, millions of Canadians would have seen and will see their first CERB payment of $2,000. I wanna thank the hardworking public servants of ESDC, Service Canada, and the Canada Revenue Agency who have worked tirelessly over the past month to deliver this critical income support program to Canadians during this crisis. At the same time, we have sought to refine our current programs to help employers ad adapt to COVID-19's realities. This morning, the Prime Minister announced temporary changes to the Canada's jo summer jobs program with greater flexibility given employers to hire young people and students and use them to provide a Canada summer jobs program for this year. These include an increase to the wage subsidy so that private and public sector employees can receive up to 100% of the provincial or territorial minimum hourly wage for each employee, an extension to the end date for employment to February 28, 2021, allowing employers to adapt their projects and job activities to support essential services, and allowing employers to hire staff on a part-time basis. These changes will help our small businesses, our local nonprofits, and our public sector employers hire and keep the workers they need so they can continue to de deliver the very important essential services in communities across Canada. They'll also help youth stay connected to the labor market, save for their return to school, and find high quality jobs in safe, inclusive, and healthy work environments. 
By adopting the program this year, the government is ensuring it's deploying the required resources to support our businesses and all Canadians survive the uh, economic impacts of Thank you, Carla. And now, over to the President of Treasury Board, Jean Duclos. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. The statement this morning is about thanking everyone, and in particular, as President of the Treasury Board, to do as Mme. Qualtrough Particularly as Treasury Board President, to do as uh, Ms. Qualtrough just did, I'd like to thank the hundreds of thousands of Canadian public servants that are working in very difficult professional and personal circumstances, given the times we're living in. And I'd especially like to thank those that are working for CRA and Service Canada for the remarkable work they've done over the last few weeks in processing nearly 4 million applications for emergency benefits. I'd also like to thank the Chambers of Commerce in Quebec and elsewhere in the country, mentioned by my uh, colleague, uh, Minister Jardy, and myself earlier, who are very active in, on behalf of businesses and who will certainly be pleased with the greater flexibility brought to the wage subsidy program as announced by the Prime Minister Trudeau this morning. So an increased flexibility for businesses in general, but increased flexibility as well for not-for-profits and charitable organizations who are doing absolutely essential work under very difficult circumstances. So to all of you, thank you. Thank you, jean -Yves. Also have with us le Dr. Nou, qui aussi est prêt à we also have Dr. Howe with us, who is prepared to answer your questions, and we are all now prepared to answer your questions. Thank you, Madam Deputy Prime Minister. Operator. Thank you. Merci. We have a question from Melanie Marquis from La Presse. Please go ahead. Votre ligne est ouverte. Thank you. Question. First question. I don't know if it's Ms. Freeland or Mr. Duclos who can tell me about the cost for this broadened wage subsidy program. Before, you said it would cost $71 billion. Now we know that new measures were announced this morning. So what is the new cost for this program? Answer. I'll try to answer. Thank you for the question. The goal, as we saw over the last few weeks, was to be both rapid and useful in our undertakings, which is why over the last few days, as we all saw, Prime Minister Trudeau and many of our cabinet colleagues were in contact with the business community in order to ensure that this greatest uh, program to support our businesses functions properly. The initial budget of $71 billion will, of course, be reviewed now but and revised. But what's even more important is that this greater eligibility will avoid even greater costs in the future, because what we must absolutely do and that's the Canadian government's determination is to avoid uh, allowing this recession to become a depression. So the uh, a solid, a robust and rapid intervention such as all these measures announced uh, most recently this morning by Prime Minister Trudeau uh, reassures our businesses so they keep our employees, so they keep their employees and ensure that we come out of this crisis more quickly. The uh, absolute essential objective of this morning's announcement when it comes to making the wage subsidies more flexible, the absolute objective is to make sure that we have all the tools that we need to prevent that recession from becoming a depression. A recession becomes a depression when the, a, a government doesn't take immediate quick and solid actions in response to a severe economic situation like the one we are currently experiencing. So, the, obviously, the, est the prior estimate of the cost of the wage subsidies will be reviewed and revised by the Minister of Finance. But what is more important now is that we understand that more businesses, non more non-profit uh, organizations, more charitable organizations, will be able to benefit more quickly and, more importantly, from the wage subsidies. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. Mélanie, en suivi. Thank you, Minister. Mélanie, do you have a follow-up question? Question. Yes, I understand, Minister Duclos, but uh, just to better understand uh, the $71 billion, is it going to be hi a higher amount? How much higher? Will we find out today? And my real follow-up question is for Ms. Freeland. Yesterday, you said 
that uh, the expected uh, shipments of masks that were in, that were held up because of the presidential decree were being dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. How many companies based in the U.S. have had to cease exporting masks? And how many masks has Canada has been deprived of because of that measure? Answer. Canada was not deprived of masks because of the presidential decree, or President Trump's decree. With respect to 3M masks, the first batch of masks arrived in Canada last night at 11.20 PM. Those masks are now here in Canada. We are now organizing the distribution of those masks across the country. And I am so pleased to be able to tell you this. I know that people who are working in our health care sector desperately need these masks. And I'm so happy that they will be able to receive them very soon. These masks are so important and necessary for them, and I want to tell all those working in healthcare in Canada, thank you so much. With respect to the relationship between Canada and the United States, when it comes to medical supplies, we have a very complex relationship in that area, so just like in, other, in every other industry. It's not just an issue of finished products. It's about all of the required elements to produce a mask, for example, or a ventilator. It's also an issue of services. I can assure you that Canada was very organized and very clear in explaining the interdependence uh, of our relationship to our American partners. I'm very pleased that, that the 3M masks are now in Canada, and we will continue to work with our American partners and companies and government in order to ensure supplies are available here in Canada and also to reassure our American partners that all the things they need from Canada will also be supplied to the United States. Um, so let me be clear. Uh, there is not a single mask, uh, as far as I am aware. There might be orders done by hospitals or provinces that I'm not aware of, but we have been encouraging provinces and hospitals to get in touch with the federal government if they are having any concerns, any issues in the United States or indeed anywhere in the world. Uh, it's a very, uh, very complicated situation and uh, in the whole world. And there's a real race on internationally for medical equipment. But when it comes to the masks, uh, we had the statement from 3M on Monday. The masks crossed the U.S. border into Canada at around 11.20 p.m. last night. They are here, and we are working uh, as quickly as possible to get them distributed around the country to our heroic health care workers uh, who need them so urgently. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from uh, Kim McRail from The Wall Street Journal. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you. This question is for the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, can you tell me, would Canada consider support for President Trump's proposal for imposing tariffs on oil from Saudi Arabia if talks uh, between OPEC countries break down? Uh, Canada is very engaged uh, in collaboration with the United States uh, at the G20 level as well uh, in working on the situation in the global oil market. Uh, we are working—the federal government is working very closely on this with the province of Alberta 
and with Premier Jason Kenney, who has been really personally engaged as well. Uh, and our energy minister, Seamus O'Regan, and the Alberta energy minister, Sonia Savage, have been very involved. Uh, all of us have been in close touch, particularly with our American partners, because of the integrated nature of the North American energy market and North American energy production. And we are obviously also working on it at the G20 level and with other global oil producers. Uh, I think uh, Canadians all appreciate uh, that some of the actions by Russia and Saudi Arabia have had unfortunate consequences on the global oil market, and that's something that, working collaboratively, uh, we are seeking to ameliorate. Follow up. Thanks. Yes, thanks. Can, can you speak specifically to the question of tariffs? Is, are tariffs on oil from Saudi Arabia something Canada would consider supporting? I chose my words carefully. Um, we are very focused on this issue. It's an important issue for Canada and the world. We are working closely uh, the federal government is working closely with the province of Alberta on this. The province of Alberta is quite correctly, very directly engaged and involved. And the federal government and the province of Alberta are working closely with our U.S. Uh, neighbors, specifically because of the highly integrated nature of the North American energy market. And we're working on it with energy producers globally. Uh, the current situation is uh, a real problem for Canada, and we are working to find ways to resolve it. Merci. Prochaine question au téléphone. Thank you. Next question on the phone. The next question is from Raymond Fillion, TVA. Please go ahead. Votre ligne est ouverte. Hello. I have a question for Minister Duclos. Mr. Duclos, many people told us that they received much more than the $2,000 expected amount for the CERB. Can you explain what is going on to us and assure, reassure us that we're not uh, seeing another phoenix take place, as some fear? Answer. Thank you for the question. Two very important things. First of all, the system is working surprisingly well. Of course, we had prepared the uh, we, the government and the public servants have worked very hard to make sure the system did work well, and we did want to uh, make sure that it was going to be operating proper, properly. So a CRA and Service Canada employees are ensuring that we re can receive and process a number of applications that are about 25 times the normal level of what we would have be receiving and, and treating, uh, processing, rather. Secondly. The system is uh, is also retroactive too. So some people received uh, retroactive payments too because the CERB is retroactive to March 15th. And then there's a payment in advance. Let's say we could call it a prospective payment as of April 11th, since the first payment covered the period from March 15th to April 11th. Now, if people are concerned or uncertain, it's absolutely uh, important to be very prudent. People must understand that it's 2000 and, and must know that it's $2,000 per month. So one must budget for $2,000 per month, independently of whether or not you receive received uh, another payment. So if you receive two, it's possible that one of them was a retroactive payment for March 15th to April 11th, and the second one is for the period going forward from uh, April 11th. Follow-up question. When it comes to the wage subsidy, Mr. Duclos, the fact that there seem to be ongoing negotiations that are going going on and on between uh, the opposition parties and the government, uh, is this going to delay the implementation of this uh, highly anticipated program? Uh, as the Prime Minister was saying this morning, we know that both programs, both the wage subsidy and the emergency benefits, are programs that are complementary. This week, we saw how essential 
potential the emergency benefit was all we, since we've already received 4 million applications. And many of those have already been processed. But we know that the, wa the emergency wage subsidy is also very important, which is why Mr. Trudeau and the House leader and uh, all the ministers around the table are working very hard with the other opposition parties to, to ensure that Parliament can be recalled to pass this important legislation as quickly as possible, which is absolutely essential to ensure that the wage subsidies can go forward. Could you repeat the answer in English, please? Uh, for all Canadians, uh, and the, 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 the issue is very important. It's a two-sided two issue. The first one is that the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, not only we knew it would be important, but we now have the confirmation that it is absolutely important for millions of Canadians. And the good news here is that the system is working due to the hard work of a large number of public servants. The second thing that we need to be mindful of, that all Canadians want to be reminded of, is that this is $2,000 per four weeks. So there are Canadians that have received a retroactive payment uh, dating from March the 15th, because that's when the, uh, the benefit can be applied. So from March the 15th to April the 11th is the first four-week period during which a $2,000 payment would have been made maybe yesterday or perhaps today. So that's $2,000 for the first payment. Some Canadians have already received a $2,000 for the second uh, payment of four weeks, which is starting on April the 11th. But let, let's us, let, let us be very clear. It's $2,000 per month. So if people have received two payments, one retroactively and one prospectively, everyone needs to manage his or her budget on the understanding that it's $2,000 per month, regardless, regardless of when that $2,000 is actually deposited in his or her bank account. Thank you, Minister. We'll now switch to the room, starting with uh, Julie from CBC. Um, yes, I'm just wondering about the uh, wage subsidy and, and its other, I guess maybe for Mr. Duclos. Um, businesses are really waiting for this uh, wage subsidy. Obviously, you, you need Parliament to pass it. Air Canada talked about applying for it today. Um, what is the fastest, assuming Parliament gets going here, that they can have this money? I think the, par uh, the Prime Minister said something about three weeks. I think the opposition says six. Is there a concern that many businesses won't be able to hang on? Well, Minister Morneau has uh, highlighted a very strong economic plan, which uh, very briefly uh, has three legs to it. The so first is secure workers, second is to secure liquidities, and second is to secure the ability of businesses to keep paying their, their workers. So on securing workers, that's the most important objectives of the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Securing liquidities with the uh, uh, Canada Emergency Business Account, which is Right now, as we're speaking, uh, allowing businesses, in particular small uh, and medium-sized businesses, to access a 40,000 emergency loan with no interest for the next two years. So that provides urgent liquidity to secure uh, businesses so that you can count on them. And the second thing is the wage, the emergency wage subsidies. So these emergency uh, wage subsidies, uh, that the, that important program is being uh, implemented in different ways. First, in terms of legislation, and that's absolutely essential to do, because it does require, as Prime Minister Trudeau said yesterday, important legislative changes uh, with which we are, on which we're working with uh, opposition parties. And the second thing is that while we do this, we obviously are preparing the public service uh, for the delivery of that important uh, wage subsidy. But of course, the actual delivery must wait for the uh, for the, uh, the decision, as, as a, a democracy requires, a decision of Parliament. Explain then, maybe in a very simple way, what is the hold-up? Why isn't uh, the House sitting right now to pass this? Maybe I will speak to that. Um, as uh, Jean-Yves has explained, uh, this is a very significant program. Uh, we think that it is the largest economic measure a Canadian government has ever put forward. Uh, for that reason, 
Uh, we believe that Parliament needs to have its say about it. We're a parliamentary democracy, and that element of parliamentary oversight is crucial. Uh, House leaders from all parties are negotiating right now for how Parliament can come back uh, to debate this legislation, and we very much hope that will happen quickly. And we very much hope that legislation will be supported. As you said in your question, Julie, this is support that Canadian businesses urgently need and that Canadian workers urgently need so that they can keep their jobs and keep food on the table. So we're working uh, very energetically with the opposition parties to bring Parliament back. That's an essential step, and I'm hopeful it will happen really soon. I'm being asked for you to please repeat that in French. Uh, la, uh, Answer repeated in French. Sub subvention à des salaires est une the wage subsidy is a very powerful measure on the part of our government. We believe it is the greatest measure ever taken by a Canadian government. Because of that, it's absolutely necessary and appropriate that Parliament have the opportunity to consider this measure. At the same time, we do understand the urgency of the measure for Canadian businesses and for Canadian workers to have to receive this support from the government. That is why the leaders of all the House of Commons political parties are working, are working extremely hard. I worked very late last night with House Leader Pablo Rodriguez about this work, which is required to recall Parliament to consider this measure. I hope we will benefit from the goodwill of all political parties. I think all Canadians understand how urgent this measure is, and I do hope we have the opportunity to debate it and to move very quickly on this measure. Thank you. I'm Mackenzie Gray from CTV. Dr. Tam and Patty Hadu, uh, this question is for you to start. Um, you both said over this period of time that testing is a very important part of coming to a conclusion of the pandemic. Uh, when we take a look at Ontario, yesterday they only tested about 2,500 people. That's below the daily goal that they got of 5,000 tests. Uh, are you concerned about Ontario's testing level? And are we withholding tests or not testing as many people as we could because we're concerned about a lack of test kits in the country? Maybe I'll start with the last part of the question first, and then I'll turn to Dr. Tam to talk about how testing strategies are created with the provinces and territories. And the short answer is no. Tests aren't being withheld. Uh, the, the testing strategy that Dr. Tam has worked out with her uh, her counterparts across the provinces and territories is really to, first of all, get to the volume that we need to, to assure that we have an, a good understanding of what the disease presentation is in Canada, but also target it so that we are using the tests in the best way to actually determine um, you know the hot spots that we see across the provinces and territories, and the, the and the risk of the disease in vulnerable populations. So I'll turn to Dr. Tam to speak about Ontario, particularly, and anything else that she'd like to add. Yes, different jurisdictions do have different laboratories testing rates, if you like. So the number of tests per capita. And that might be uh, as a result of where they are in the epidemic curve. But I do agree that we need to increase our laboratory testing in Canada uh, writ large, but certainly for jurisdictions that experience the most activity. So what we're doing is not just providing um, a consensus on guidance on who to test, but really looking at every stream of testing capacity, whether it's PCR testing to increase that. Uh, I know Public Health Ontario's laboratory is trying to um, in improve that as, as they're going along. We're there to help as much as possible. And getting the reagents and getting all of those supplies to the provinces and territories is what we're focusing on, but also testing some of the newer capabilities like uh, the nearer patient tests. Uh, that might be important for different areas of Ontario. Of course, Ontario is a very big jurisdiction. And so uh, we're working really tightly with the uh, provincial laboratories. But it's really, again, it's a bit like other supplies. We're pulling out every stop 
to try and get as much testing capacity as possible in, in Canada. Um, but there, there is definitely variations in terms of uh, lab testing rates across the country. Um, the follow-up is for Deputy Prime Minister Freeland. Uh, over the past week or so, maybe now, the New York Times, Bloomberg, The Washington Post have all reported that China has underrepresented both the infection rate and the death rate. The U.S. government has also said that they have intelligence that says that uh, they have done that as well. We asked the health minister about this. She said that there is no indication that the data that has come out of China in terms of their rates of infection and their death rates were falsified in any way. So two questions for you. As a Five Eyes partner, have we seen any of the intelligence that the U.S. has that says that China has falsified any of this data? And personally, do you believe the numbers that China has put out around COVID-19? So... Let me start by talking about our collaboration with the WHO. Uh, this is a global pandemic, and Canada absolutely understands that a global response to it is essential. The multilateral organization charged with coordinating that global response is the WHO. And when it comes to data from various countries and when it comes to the multilateral effort around that, the WHO and our own health experts who work closely with the WHO are where we turn. Having said that, Canada is a uh, very energetic member of the Five Eyes. And we have uh, a close and very important security and intelligence partnership with the United States in the Five Eyes, in NATO, and in NORAD. And so, of course, uh, we do share intelligence information through the Five Eyes. It is charged—the Five Eyes are charged with doing that. And we have very frequent uh, security and intelligence conversations with the United States. A reason that we are able to have those conversations, which are very important in the crisis that the world is experiencing today, is because those conversations happen in private. And so I am not able to share details of what is discussed in those conversations. Good morning, guys. Um, so let's talk about non-COVID patients. I've been hearing of major surgeries that have been postponed, not just elective, like cancer surgeries. And doctors that are healthcare, you know, clinic doctors who are deferring people until a later date once this clears up. But if this takes months, what implications is that of deferring our healthcare until this clears up in the future? So I'll start and then I'll talk to Doc, I'll turn to Dr. Tam for obviously the work that she's doing with her colleagues. Um, First of all, uh, I want to thank all of the healthcare practitioners across the country who are making these uh, very difficult decisions about which uh, procedures to postpone, uh, how to manage clients or uh, people, patients that are um, that are ill with a variety of severity of illnesses, uh, including mental illness, by the way, which is uh, other, another area that we haven't talked a lot about. But in fact, patients are having a hard time accessing professionals in the in the in the area of mental illness as well. Um, these are difficult times, and these are difficult, heart-wrenching decisions, and they are not taken lightly, I know, at any level of decision-making, whether it is provincial guidance that is uh, being provided through ministries of health or at the local level uh, as hospitals and practitioners decide how best to try to continue to treat patients while also preparing for a surge in a hospital setting. Um, I do want to thank them for that hard work, because I know as much as Canadians are struggling and suffering and also postponing surgeries that for some of us might not think are essential, but of course are essential in their own lives, um, these are tremendous sacrifices. But also the healthcare professionals whose entire lives have been built around helping people in crisis and are now struggling to do that. Uh, we owe them a debt of gratitude for these difficult, difficult decisions they're making. Maybe, Dr. Tam, you can talk a little bit about the guidance that's provided at the national level for uh, preparing for surge. Well, I think it's it's a very dynamic situation in different uh, provinces and territories. But what the the chief medical officers are very seized with is not only trying to uh, ascertain the impact of the actual public health measures that that are sort of reducing the impact of of the COVID nineteen itself, but what are the other consequences 
uh, negative consequences of our measures. And that is the area that we want to obviously focus on. I think everybody's attention right now is to get past that initial peak. So everything will be done, and whatever, whenever that is, it's dependent on our action now. Everybody, I hope, has heard that message, is that right now is a really critical time for jurisdictions, um, provinces and territories that are looking at, well, when can some of this resume, is I think they will be looking at, until you're past that peak, you can't really um, provide those kind of dynamic decisions. But that's the kind, exactly the kind of thing that they are looking at right now, is how do we resume some of these without uh, impacting on the capacity to cope with the COVID-19 patients? Um, but it's, a, it's an incredible question and one that is everyone uh, is on top of their minds, for sure. Thank you. And I just got a new one in, so. An Ipsos poll for Global News suggests one quarter of Canadians reported that they are not strictly following the social distancing advice of public health officials. C cities across the country have also logged thousands of reports of people not following the rules. Do you have any tools left that you're willing to use to crack down on people refusing to social distance? So um, at the federal level, obviously, uh, we have certain jurisdictional responsibilities, and that's largely supporting provinces and territories and dealing with federal borders. And many of the tools that we have, we've used to varying degrees at varying, varying times. And of course, we uh, rely on the Special Advisory Committee of Public Health Officials to talk about additional tools that could be imposed. But I think... Um, if you look at that statistic, what it actually says to me is 75% of Canadians are actually following social distancing. And uh, of course, it's challenging for uh, a variety of people to do that for a variety of different reasons. We continue to add measures and continue to encourage people to do that. And of course, at provincial and municipal levels, there are a whole bunch of tools being implemented from fines to phone lines for people to call. Um, and I think Dr. Tam's last answer is a very important thing to reflect on. Um, the tools that we use have to be commensurate with the risk and have to be applied in a way that don't uh, don't increase suffering in people's lives to the degree that have long-lasting impacts. And we can see that we're, the world is in a difficult place. I mean, we're trying as best as we can to beat a, a global pandemic, a virus which there is no cure and there is no uh, there is no vaccine for uh, using, I would say, relatively primi primitive tools, tools that have been used over centuries to prevent uh, the spread of disease. So as we do that, um, and as we apply additional measures, we have to be extremely thoughtful about how we do that to get to the intended public health goal, which is to reduce the spread um, and to actually save lives, but also understand the long-lasting implications in other people's lives and uh, and have some kindness and and patience with people as they learn to live in a new way. So I would um, look at this from two directions. One is supporting people to better social distance or to self-isolate. Uh, for example, we're looking at, well, do we need to provide some alternative accommodation for people who can't self-isolate uh, appropriately at home? Um, so working with the provinces, looking at that isolation plan. So if there are vulnerable people at home and they can't self-isolate, let's help them. So lots of these measures to help maybe nudging and other tools. Uh, apps are being studied in different places to see, well, how can we encourage people to know that they're not social distancing? You may have seen some of the Google work looking at, in fact, in Canada, many areas of Canada, we've really fundamentally reduced our mobility. Like we're some, in the sort of whole North American context, our province is at the top of the list in terms of reduction in mobility, for example. So th those innovative tools tell us something about how our public health measures are working. Then on the other side, in terms of compliance uh, relation to quarantine orders, so we, as we follow up people um, and check in on them, sometimes we find that we can't reach them. And we have tools to, of course, work with our um, um, peace officers to try and find them, so that they will know that this is a really serious thing we're talking about. We've got a mandatory order on self-quarantine uh, when you enter Canada, and that is serious, and we, uh, we mean to uh, look at compliance for that. So we do every day 
find people who haven't answered our phone calls and have to be chased down. Uh, and every province, every municipality are exercising some measure of that concept. But I think both, uh, supportive wherever possible, I think is my take. But when needed, uh, some of these uh, fines and compliance measures are there to, for an added bit of a serious message, I think. Thank you, Doctor. And I'll turn back to the phone for two more questions. And that's all the time we have for today. Operator. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Marie Vastel Le Devoir. Please go ahead. Votre ligne est ouverte. Question. Yes. My question is for you, Ms. Freeland. Earlier, you said during the press conference that Canada was deprived of no masks by American companies exporting into our country. But I'd like to know what about the future? Are we to then understand? The, the whole issue of President Trump's decree is resolved. The White House seems to be suggesting that the decree were not uh, applicable to exports to Canada. Can you tell us whether you received your own assurances from the American administration that this issue has been resolved? Answer. Thank you for the question. And as to the masks, I will say, repeat in French, as I said in English, that with respect to the purchases uh, that we've already made. I do have information about those. There may be other purchases by provinces and hospitals that I am. Um, but I do want to assure you and tell you right now that all prov and tell all provinces and all hospitals that the federal government is here to help the provinces and help our hospitals in making these purchases outside the country. We are moving ahead. We have excellent ambassadors in the U.S., in China, across the world, and we are working in close collaboration with provinces and even with certain hospitals to make these purchases. With respect to the United States, and the issue of purchasing medical supplies from the U.S. This is an issue we are currently discussing and resolving. All Canadians now know that we did have issues around the purchase of the 3M masks, but we are resolving many other specific issues as well. I would like to emphasize that we have had and are continuing to have a conversation on several other levels with respect to this issue with our American partners. We've explained that when it comes to medical services, like all of the relationships, uh, various relationships we have with the United States, is a reciprocal relationship. It is a relationship which is truly interdependent. We need the United States, but at the same time, they need us too. We explained that. And we made the argument that a win-win solution is in the interest of both countries. I think that we did, we, we, that we were understood by our American partners and counterparts. At the same time, we have to continue to work on this issue. It is a very difficult situation for all countries in the world, including Canada and including the United States. It is truly a crisis, and we have to work day on a daily basis and on an hourly basis and keep, keep working. That's what we must do. And I must also emphasize how important the premier's and pr province's role is. This is an issue we are all working together on as Team Canada. Thank you so much. Qu follow up question? Yes. Uh, my follow up question is as follows. I just want to be clear where we're at then. Was there progress made beyond the 3M? A case. You said you're working on a case-by-case case 
approach with various co companies. So you said you're working on other specific issues. What does that mean? Does that mean that since yesterday you reached an agreement with certain companies to be exempted from the Trump administration's decree? And if so, how many companies and uh, how many how many supplies? Answer. I do not wish to get into the details of specific cases, but I can tell you that up till now, we have managed to resolve the, the, the issues and that we will have to continue to do that work. And that's quite normal. Trade relationships require persistent work. And Canada knows how to do that, and Canada will continue to do so. Uh, so, uh, we are pleased with the resolution of the situation with 3M, and we are delighted that uh, the first part of Canada's order from 3M has been resolved and that those 500,000 masks are here in Canada. Uh, more broadly, we have been making the case uh, for many days now to our American partners that when it comes to medical equipment and services, the relationship between Canada and the United States is truly reciprocal. We are dependent on one another, and both countries will be best served if we can continue to work together. Um, that is the argument we have been making, speaking about some very specific examples of the role Canada plays in the U.S. medical supply chain, of the role that Canadian services play in the U.S. healthcare care system. Uh, thus far, uh, we have been met with real comprehension uh, from our American partners, both in the administration and also at the business level, because American businesses really understand the extent to which the supply chains are interdependent. Um, this is work uh, that is constant, uh, and we just have to keep at it. Uh, and, by the way, that is the nature of our trading relationship with the United States in general, that it requires constant work, constant gardening. And in this time of a true global pandemic, of a real crisis, it requires particular attention. And we are devoting absolutely that necessary attention to it. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. One last question, Operator. Thank you. The next question is from Althea Raj from the HuffPost Canada. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. We're turning it left. Thank you. I think my question is for Minister Tsu or Minister Freeland. I'd like to know if Cabinet considered a broad-based universal uh, payment approach as a way of catching all Canadian workers whose income may have been affected by COVID-19. And if you did consider it, why did you rule it out? Well, thank you for the question. If I may answer very broadly, but as, as well quite specifically, what we are seeing in the context of this uh, emergency is that our social security system wasn't designed and therefore wasn't prepared to handle such a, an emergency situation. Now, we knew, of course, before the crisis that there were some holes in our social security system uh, due in part to the changing demographics and the changing work circumstances of many Canadian workers. So there are obviously lessons that we are learning and that we will we'll be learning over the next uh, few weeks and months as to how we will, as a country, emerge with a not only a better understanding of the vast diversity of Canada and Canadians, but also the vast, imp the considerable importance that the federal government needs to keep playing when it comes to securing not only the livelihoods, but also the ability of everyone to participate fully in, the, in our economy, both in crisis, but also uh, outside of crisis. I will end, therefore, by saying that we are of course, mind the, mindful that we need to focus our attention on the urgency of the situation, 
what we are learning and we're also hearing uh, from others uh, within and outside the government that there will be lessons and therefore uh, things to discuss and perhaps to do after the crisis. Um, that is a lovely response, but it has nothing to do with the question I asked you. Did Cabinet consider universal payments as a way of catching all Canadian workers, as opposed to this piecemeal approach that we are now seeing? And if you did consider it, what were the reasons that you decided ruled that option out? Well, I would uh, remind uh, everyone that what we are doing is rather universal because we are universally supported supporting workers both that would perhaps have been able to receive support from employment insurance but also those that would not have been able to receive any support so we are working in an emergency situation where we are in fact doing things that canada and canadians have never done no, the EI system wasn't designed for that. So we have put into place a system at relatively high speed and with relatively good outcomes uh, where you know, we see millions of Canadians being given emergency assistance in a context in which many Canadians, millions of Canadians need and demand that assistance. So we are uh, demonstrating that when we work, as we, as we work together, we're listening and, and inputting the advice of many people outside of the government. We can do great things in Canada and great things as Canadians, in particular doing things that are quite universal in their nature at a particular moment. Althea, it's Christia. I just want to add one point about the wage subsidy. Uh, program and a particular advantage that it offers and a reason that this was a program uh, that we are really delighted to be offering to Canadians. Uh, the wage subsidy program offers, on top of the CERB, a particular benefit, and that is two particular benefits. First, it helps to retain that crucial link between employers and their job. That is absolutely essential psychologically for people to know you're not only having an income, but you have a job and you have a job that is still there. It is also crucial in terms of the ability of businesses to keep going and to remain operational and for us collectively, therefore, to be in a position to come roaring back economically when we are able to relax the essential health measures that are in place right now. So I would really like Canadians not to understate the value of the particular structure of the wage subsidy program. This is going to maintain that essential connection between people and their jobs, and it is going to help businesses remain fully functional and intact. It is a great program, and we all really, really hope that Parliament will come together soon to support this program and keep Canadian companies and the Canadian economy strong through this difficult time. Thank you. Merci. Ceci met fin à la conférence de presse. Thank you. This puts okay, an end and to that the is the conference. end of the federal cabinet and pu federal public health officials briefing today on the pandemic. The big news from the federal government today are some major changes to the wage subsidy program, now allowing businesses to qualify if they've lost even 15 percent of their revenue in March, also allowing them to choose different months, to January to February, as a reference period. Uh, it also now says that ch the government also now says that charities uh, can also apply for the wage subsidy and can choose whether or not to include their government subsidy in their overall revenues. We will get more details on this from Bill Morneau at 1.30 Eastern. And I should say it does have to go through Parliament, and they are still negotiating a date to recall at least some MPs to have that debate inside the House of Commons. Um, but we will leave it on that note, because Quebec is giving an update at this hour on the situation in that province. Here is Francois Legault and provincial officials right now in Quebec City. Everyone in CHSLDs to know whether they have the virus, so the employees as well as the residents. So we'll be testing everyone to know properly what the situation is and to be able to follow 
those places where things are more difficult. So Daniel is going to be talking to you about the residences for the elderly later, but I still want to come back to the guidelines for the elderly who live at home. It's important. Ideally, no contact, so we ask them not to go out. We are also asking those who take food to them to keep two meters away from them, to not take advantage of the fact that they're there, you know, to start chatting. You can do that over the phone after. So it's really, really important to keep that distance. The last thing that we want is for people over 70 years of age to catch the virus. So let's keep that in mind. And it's true for Easter. So I'll be the first, you know, I'm used to every year. It's like Mother's Day. At Easter, I would go to my mother's, but now I'm not going to go to my mother's. I'll be calling her on Sunday, of course, but I won't be going to see her. So I want us to mobilize ourselves, all of society, all Quebecers, to do everything to protect our elderly. That should be our priority mission in the upcoming days and weeks. So the numbers for the day. Unfortunately, 25 new deaths. We are now at 175 deaths. Of course, I wish to offer my condolences to those families of the victims. We have now 10,031 confirmed cases, an increase of 691. 632 people are being hospitalized. That is an increase of 49. And out of those 682, there's 181 people who are in intensive care. So an increase of only 17. And I wish to tell you, yes, I have to cough in my elbow. I'm sorry, next time. I wish to tell you that it's been a few days that we've been seeing that it's really stabilizing in terms of hospitalizations. That really, truly is good news. That means that we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. We are starting to, if it continues this way, we are starting to win that fight that we're waging, which is encouraging, and which brings us to start preparing the next steps, that is, the reopening of uh, stores and businesses. But I just want to tell you, we're not there yet. We still have to keep seeing these kinds of days as we've had in the past few days when there's no big increases in the number of hospitalizations and a number of people in intensive care, which does not prevent us from preparing ourselves. And I wish to perhaps talk to entrepreneurs, to owners, to managers of businesses to explain with you to you the discussions that we are having with public health. So first, of course, when we reopen businesses, it will be very important, first of all, to concentrate on those businesses where people really can. And here, I make a call out to the responsibility of owners and managers to remain two meters away. Employees have to be able to, at all times, being two meters away from their colleagues and two meters away, if uh, that is the case as well, from clients. That is going to be a very important criteria. And the two meters, get used to it in Quebec. That's going to last months. So in the next few days, next few weeks, we're thinking about reopening businesses, but the guideline for the two meters will remain for months. So get used to that guideline. Of course, as well, when we're thinking of reopening businesses and stores, well, of course, that also will have uh, an effect on daycare. Of course, it's uh, difficult to respect the two meters in schools and in, in, in daycare, so we have to ask ourselves questions. If we want workers to go back to work, well, what happens with the children? What is going to happen with public transportation uh, and rush hour? So we're going to be asking in the next few days, we'll ask employers to see how we could be more flexible with schedules so that not all workers use public transportation uh, during rush hour, you know, in the morning and at the end of the afternoon, because we don't want, of course, uh, for people to be all uh, in a bunch in the trains and metros and buses. So it's just to show you that it's not that simple.
I'm seeing certain comments of people who are saying, well, all businesses that are two meters away should all be reopened tomorrow morning. Yeah, okay, what are you going to do with the kids? What are you going to do with the employees who need to use public transport? We have to take precautions. So yes, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to, in the next few days and weeks, to start reopening businesses and stores, but we have to be prudent, and we must make a call out to the responsibility and uh, accountability of employers. And the numbers have to continue stabilizing. And for those numbers to continue stabilizing, we have to keep working hard. I know that we're asking a lot of Quebecers, but it is important to remain disciplined. I wish to now get back to the scenarios that were presented yesterday by the experts of public health. For me, there's two data there that is very reassuring. First of all, the projections on the number of hospitalizations and the number of people who would be in intensive care depending on the different scenarios. You saw that in intensive care, in the most pessimistic of scenarios, which is that of an Italian style or a little bit like what happened in Spain, we would need a thousand beds with ventilators in intensive care. And that, if it's necessary, we have it. We don't believe that it will be necessary, but we have that capacity of having a thousand beds with ventilators if the pessimistic scenario were the one to take place. So that is very good news that we got yesterday during the presentation. The second good news that we got in the data that was presented yesterday is to see that up until now, our scenario, that of Quebec, is a lot closer to that of the best countries, such as Germany, as opposed to the countries where there were more deaths. And that we, this is due to Quebec's respecting guidelines. So I think that we can be proud of the results that we've had up until now while saying, you know, let's not stop. We started really well. We are heading the right way. The daily thanks. I wish to give those thanks to all those people who are working in CHSLDs and those and the residences for the elderly, whether it be doctors, nurses, attendants. I know that the situation is hard, and I just want to tell you first, courage, reinforcements are coming. And I also wish to say thank you so much for your devotion in circumstances that are very difficult in CHSLDs and residences for the elderly. So a very special thank you today to all those who work in those residences. And I'd like to end by perhaps concentrating on the two-meter guideline, because each Quebecer is going to have to visualize themselves in the next few weeks and months of always staying two meters away from other people. So of course, this is a new culture. So, you know, we can't shake hands, we can't be too close to other people, so let's try all together to start visualizing this. You know that for a certain number of months, this is how it's going to be. We're going to be staying two meters away from other people. So, I would like to conclude by saying the last few days' data make me optimistic. We're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. We are starting to win that fight together. I'm very proud of the work that has been done by Quebecers who have been unified since the beginning. We just have to keep working hard to make sure that we can start and we are okay. going to leave Quebec City and take you to Toronto, where the Premier of Ontario, Doug Ford, is speaking. Let's listen. It's been very difficult. Our thoughts and prayers are with those who have lost loved ones to this terrible virus, and with those who are suffering with COVID right now. The reality is this virus has taken a massive toll on all of us. The huge strain on families, seniors, who can't have their loved ones visit them right now. The economic fallout, countless people losing their jobs, struggling right now. 
and I know how hard it is for everyone isolating at home. But this period has been hardest for our essential workers. They're getting up every day. They're leaving their families and children behind. And getting to work, I know that's not easy. And I know it's causing anxiety for them and their loved ones. But I want you to know that Ontario recognizes your sacrifice. And I want you to know, I want our dedicated men and women on the front lines to know that Ontario has your back. You have an army of 14 and a half million people behind you, from every person isolating at home to the incredible companies stepping up, retooling to get supplies to the front lines. And yesterday, we put out another call to action. We called Ontario for more boots on the ground, reinforcements for our healthcare workers. We launched a system to connect people with healthcare skills to healthcare jobs that desperately need to be filled. And the response has been absolutely incredible. As of today, we've seen nearly 8,000 individuals sign up. And there are already 1,000 people matched to potential jobs. We're going to deploy those workers as soon as possible, filling vacancies in the healthcare system all across Ontario. And now we're making sure we have the necessary infrastructure. We have the beds we need. That's why today we're accelerating critical construction projects in our healthcare sector. We're extending the hours of construction to help get these projects built faster, to help get hospitals built faster, to get more beds and more capacity built in the system. That includes assessment centers, and temporary structures needed to prepare for any surge in COVID-19 cases. We have to be ready for any scenario. And the health and safety of our essential workers is always top of mind during this pandemic. That's why we're introducing new measures today to keep essential workers across Ontario safe and healthy. Whether you work in a grocery store or on a construction site, we're looking out for you. We're redeploying inspectors to ramp up investigations. We're issuing a call to all retired inspectors to join the fight against COVID-19 and help keep employees safe and healthy during these uncertain times. I'll let Minister McNaughton speak more to these important measures in a moment. But first, with a long weekend ahead of us, I have an important message for our essential workers. We've been listening to business owners and employees. The truth is that everyone working in our grocery stores and pharmacies, our truck drivers and those working the line, they've been working day and night for weeks to keep the food and medicine we need on the shelves. And one way we're saying thank you is making sure they have this Friday and Sunday off. They deserve a break and some quality time with their families. Stores will be open Thursday, Saturday, and of course, again, Monday onwards. Let's give our workers a break they've earned. Today, we're also saying thank you to our truck drivers. Truckers can pick up a free coffee today on us at any en route location. Thank you to all our heroes out there, our healthcare workers, our essential workers, all the caregivers and truck drivers, you're incredible. We owe you everything. Thank you, and God bless the people of Ontario. Well, thank you. The health and safety of workers is always a top priority of this government. Never has there been a time when that's more important. There's a lot of hardship out there and a lot of fear but I also see a lot of gratitude. Gratitude for the people who are going about their jobs so that all of us can get through this. The call center workers, the healthcare workers, the grocery store clerks, the pharmacists, the builders and tradespeople, and of course, the truckers. I could list hundreds more. 
These workers are performing vital services. They're helping us get by in very trying times. Families across Ontario bang their pots and pans for them every night at 7.30. My family has put a blue ribbon on the tree outside our house. They're unsung heroes. Well, if you're one of the unsung heroes that's going about your work in an essential business, I want you to know this. Our government is doing everything in its power to keep you safe during this pandemic. That means more inspectors, more inspections, more phone lines and more people to take calls. No stone is being left unturned. And that's why I want to add another job to the list of unsung heroes, the workplace inspectors. These women and men performed nearly 5,000 inspections last month, and they're doing thousands more now. I talked to Kevin, Peter, and a couple other inspectors recently. They told me they were honoured to be playing their role during these trying times. This is truly public service. Our inspectors are going into places to investigate problems, places where workers think they're in danger. They're sorting those problems out, working with employers and employees and encouraging parties to work together. Where warranted, they're shutting workplaces down. They are the ones following up on complaints to our phone line. That phone line is 877-202-0008, where any worker in Ontario can call to express their concerns. Today, I'm announcing a number of advances in our mission to keep workers safe on the job. First, we've extended invitations to recently retired inspectors to come back on the job. Second, we're redeploying more than 30 employment standards officers to help businesses understand and comply with health and safety requirements. Third, we're deploying another 30 specialists from various health and safety associations to support employers and workers in the field. Fourth, we're issuing more health and safety guidance notes to support specific sectors. And finally, we're doubling the capacity of Ontario's health and safety call centre to 50 lines from its current capacity of 25. The total result of the five action items I've announced today will be more inspections, more capacity for workers to voice concerns, and more capacity to follow up on those reports. If you're a worker in Ontario, I want to tell you I appreciate your service, and so do the millions of people who you are helping. Thank you. If you ever feel unsafe doing your job, call 877-202-0008. Our government is working day and night to support you. We will leave no stone unturned when it comes to keeping workers healthy and safe across the province. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, uh, Minister. Ivana, before we start the, the questions, I, I want to uh, address a, a couple things that have uh, been on my mind for the last little while. There's two things that I'm zoned in on. One, the PPE items that, uh, again, we're working day and night, and I, I do see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, but we, we need to continue to, to, to work hard. Number two, that, that I haven't been in, involved in, and I've been pretty transparent right from the beginning, I, I rely on our health experts to give myself, give my Deputy Premier and Minister of Health, Christine Elliott, uh, advice. And we have a great, great deal of, of respect for the health professionals. We have some of the best uh, health minds uh, anywhere in the world uh, sitting at our COVID command table. Uh, what is concerning me, and I've been on the phone uh, last night with the CEO of Ontario Health, Matt Anderson. I was on the command table today. Uh, what is unacceptable, absolutely unacceptable, are the numbers of testing that we're doing. I may not understand health, but what people understand around this province and what I understand are numbers. And we also understand countries that have tested and ramped up testing has shown results. As I mentioned to our, our command table and to the CEO last night, you know, my patients have run thin and no more excuses. It's unacceptable. 
We have the capacity now. Before I understand, we didn't have the reagent. We didn't have all the testing. We have the testing capabilities. We have the assessment centers uh, capabilities. We have the reagent. We say we can do 13,000 a day. Then we need to start doing 13,000 every single day. I want to see every single long-term care facility tested, every patient. I want to see the uh, health care workers uh, tested at the long-term care, along with senior residents. I want to see every frontline health care worker in this province tested, along with the first responders, our police, our fire, our paramedics. We owe it to them, along with other people being tested. The days are done of these two and 3,000 a day being tested. And moving forward, moving forward, we need to see 13,000 tests every single day. I have the confidence of our health team. I have the confidence of our leadership at the table. We have to make this happen. And we need to start doing it immediately, starting tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the phone line for questions. First question. First question comes from Colin DeMello from CTV News. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Premier. So a lot of the questions you're probably going to be getting today is about testing, and I just wanted to kick it off by asking you, so do you feel as though right now um, the command table, yourself, your health minister, do you guys have an accurate view of just how far COVID-19 is actually spread across Ontario? Well, I, I go back, uh, Colin, and first of all, I, I want to tell you something. I have the best deputy premier and the best minister of health I could, I could ever ask for. And uh, Christine's just been working her back off all day and all night, and I'm just so grateful uh, for her leadership and, and partnership with, with myself and the, the rest of our, our team. Uh, to get a, a full scale, uh, it's, it's common sense. The more people you test, the better the, better the numbers are going to be. And uh, again, it's unacceptable. There's no more excuses uh, why we're testing 3,000 a day or a little over 3,000. We need to see 13,000 people tested every single day moving forward. Uh, Colin, it, it, it hurts me coming out here every day and seeing the incredible job uh, my Deputy Premier and Minister of Health is doing and uh, constantly under, under fire. Well, those days are done. We're gonna move forward on a rapid fashion to make sure every single person uh, possible can get tested. And we need to start uh, making sure that we test the frontline healthcare workers, test the long-term care as a priority, because that, that's where we're seeing it spread uh, fastest. But that's the least thing we could do with uh, the sacrifices these frontline uh, men and women are doing for, for our province and for our country. We need to support them. And I'm giving you my word, the support is coming. Uh, Premier, I mean, we've known about COVID-19 since, you know, the middle of January in this province when we first had the first case, and testing has slowly ramped up since then. Uh, why has it taken roughly three months for this to come to your attention? I mean, you, you've been taking this uh, bulls by the, uh, the, the bull by the horns approach, but why is it taking you so long for this to come to your immediate attention and to your front burner personally? Well, again, I, I rely on our, our healthcare team and make no mistake about it. Uh, we have an incredible health team. We have the brightest doctors I say in the world and I'll stand by that day in and, and day out. Uh, if it wasn't uh, enough assessment centers and then we didn't have enough testing and then we needed more reagent, the, the, they're done now, we have that. So we need to move on this and we need to move immediately. And I, as I've always said, Colin, I've been very clear with the public. I've stayed out of the way of uh, the healthcare professionals and I'm gonna continue staying out of the way. But when it comes to testing and the numbers, uh, Colin, you understand numbers, the 14 and a half million people in this province understand numbers. And uh, we know one thing, when you increase testing, you're gonna get better results on uh, making sure uh, we're measuring the people of, of uh, Ontario, who has COVID, who doesn't, what areas uh, we see the spikes in. So we're, we're going to get a move on it. And, and thank you, Colin. Next question. Next question comes from Robert Benzie from the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Hi, Premier. So to, if, to your point, if we've been getting around 3,000 tests done a day, a day and we want to see 13,000 tests a day starting tomorrow, so 10,000 increase, what happens if uh, these tests aren't done? What's the, is there going to be some sort of 
retribution from the government on on health care workers or doctors or what what's the punishment if they don't get the test well uh, robert i i just don't believe in in um, threatening i just don't believe in it we're asking for their help i'm saying i want you know i want the people want and it's up to them to execute it and they will they'll get the job done and uh, again, uh, it's unacceptable. I'm, I'm first to admit it. And, and we're relying on our health uh, expertise and uh, experts around that table. They understand health uh, better than any of them, any of us. And I just want them to make sure that we increase the testing. I've made myself loud and clear to the table. I've made myself loud and clear uh, to, to uh, the CEO of Ontario Health. And uh, we're, we're gonna get it done. Uh, I'm going to be on this like a dog on a bone right now uh, because we, we have to. We have to for the sake of our frontline healthcare workers to protect them, give them a little bit of ease of mind that they know they've been tested. And I understand after being tested, being in that position, you can, you can go out after being tested and two days later still get COVID-19. But it's better being tested than not being tested. And we need to start testing everyone possible after our frontline healthcare workers and and first responders, we need to start testing everyone. Simultaneously, as we're testing the frontline healthcare workers, we need to continue testing people. And uh, we, we have the assessment uh, sites ready. We, we have the testing uh, uh, capabilities right now. And we have the reagent. So there's no, no more excuses. We need to get it done, bottom line. And on a related subject, I know you said that the two things, the other thing that's been concerning you is, uh, is the protective, personal protective equipment uh, case. The Prime Minister says that 500,000 of those 3M masks are arriving in, on, in Canada. Is Ontario going to get 40% that it's, it's shared by population of those masks? Well, I'm, I'm really hoping so. My last call was about 11.40 p.m. last night with the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, again, uh, Deputy Prime Minister is doing an incredible job, so is the Prime Minister. Uh, but we, uh, we need our 40%. Uh, we're 40% of the population. That's what we need. But uh, we're, you know, we're, we're there to support and work collaboratively with the uh, federal government. But we can't just rely on the federal government. We're out there sourcing all around the world, and we have a lot of hooks in the water right now uh, all over the place. And... Uh, we're, we're confident. I'm, I'm a lot more confident now, today, and, and yesterday than I was a, a couple days ago. Again, we're seeing some light at the end of the tunnel, but that doesn't mean to sit back on our laurels. Uh, we have a team out there uh, reaching out and making sure that we contact as many people as possible. There's thousands of people offering, and you have to decipher. Uh, some are real, uh, some aren't real, too. So we have to make sure that uh, when this equipment comes in, the NN95s, they get, uh, they get tested, they get properly tested. We send them over to UHN to get tested as well, Health Canada and uh, SGS uh, to make sure they're certified in their real N95 uh, masks. There's a lot of fraud going on out there around the world. And uh, we have to make sure that when we purchase these uh, items, and this protective equipment is real. I have another great story about the, uh, the gowns, uh, surgical gowns. So there's a, a couple, a uh, few companies out there that are ramping up to do the surgical gowns. So everything is ramping up and coming together now on the PPE uh, side of things. But uh, the PPE is one thing, uh, but being tested is another. And we have to focus on making sure um, as we're working on PPE uh, items that uh, simultaneously uh, we're doing uh, testing. Next question. Next question comes from Cynthia Mulligan from City News. Please go ahead. Hi, Premier. Hi, Cynthia. Not only have we had so few tests done in this province, yeah. we're also the lowest per capita of any province in this country. You've been asked about this many times by myself and other reporters over the last few days and, and weeks. Where has the failing been? Why has Ontario had the lowest rate in the country? What has the failure been? Well, what the barrier was in, uh, prior was, was the reagent. Uh, again, uh, Cynthia, I'm not going to look uh, in the past. We're going to learn from the past mistakes and we're going to move forward. And uh, I know moving forward, uh, that, that testing is going to be ramped up. 
uh, again, no more excuses. Uh, it's unacceptable. I'm, I'm, I agree with you 100%. Uh, I could give you every excuse under the, the book why it wasn't happening, be it the, the testing capabilities or, or the assessment centers or not having enough reagent. I'm, I'm done with that. I'm done. We have everything in place. No more excuses. And uh, as, as you can see, I'm, I'm a little frustrated. Uh, and I'm not frustrated per se with the, the people because we have great people. And I, I, I want to emphasize that uh, to the public. We have a great health team, but we, we have to get moving on this immediately, immediately. But Premier, uh, mm -hmm. to follow up on that, every province had the same challenge of getting reagent and setting up assessment clinics. We're the ones who have, have come out on the bottom there. How is that possible? Well, I've been, I've been following uh, the advice from our chief medical officer. I've been taking that. I, I think he's been doing a, a great job, but we need to increase testing. Uh, again, I, I could run through a million excuses. Uh, why? I, I don't believe in excuses. Let's come up with solutions, not excuses, but solutions. And what are we going to do moving forward? Well, we're going to make sure more people are being tested. And, and uh, I'm confident uh, when we come in here day after day, uh, we're going to see results and uh, we're going to make sure we, we see results. Next question. Next question comes from Travis Zenrush of Global News. Please go ahead. Hey there, Premier. Uh, Hi, first question is on the testing, as you would expect. Um, so when you spoke to the... the I'm sorry, uh, people, Travis, could you repeat that first part again? Yeah, the, it's on testing. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Right, okay, so um, when you spoke to the command table, what was their reaction and did they say you said that you want uh you know 13,000 tests starting tomorrow you want every single frontline healthcare worker tested and every single long-term care worker tested did they say yes premier this is going to be feasible um starting this week and, and, and just tell us a little bit more about how that conversation went, went and what they said to you in response to your concerns well uh, what, what i heard was yes we're going to get it done and and uh, we, we have a relatively new CEO at Ontario Health, which I have a great deal of respect for. Uh, he's a very, very bright individual, and uh, he gets frustrated at times too, like, like all of us. Uh, you know something? Uh, I, I believe in Dale Carnegie. He apologized, uh, and he said it's not going to happen again, and this is what we're going to do to correct it. He has a plan, and he's going to get the testing done. I respect that. I respect that someone uh, realizes it hasn't gone down the right road and uh, we're going to make it happen. Again, we could sit here when we talk about a government the size of Ontario and, and give you every reason. Uh, I don't believe in that. I believe in let's get this moving, move forward, learn by our mistakes and make sure this doesn't happen again. And uh, I have all the confidence uh, in the world in uh, Matt Anderson over at Ontario Health. He's going to get it done. So uh, I have a question for uh, for you on cottage country, but just to follow up on that, uh, so are you saying you're confident 13,000 tests will start as of tomorrow? Well, I'm, I'm not going to quantify exactly the, the, the numbers, but what I am saying is 3,000 tests or a little over 3,000 tests are totally unacceptable. Uh, we have the capabilities of 13,000 a test a day, and there's no more excuses why we shouldn't be getting 13,000 a day. That's going to be our goal. I'll be following up uh, with our team later today and make sure that the, the plan is very clear. Uh, start testing the frontline folks at uh, long-term care, test the residents, and test the, the, the seniors and seniors' homes, and uh, make sure we test uh, all frontline healthcare workers and along with making sure we test our, our police officers, our firefighters, our paramedics. And it's, it's critical we take care of these people. Simultaneously, we have to continue uh, testing the public as well. It's all hands on deck right now. And uh, test, 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 and don't stop testing. So let's see over the next few days. Uh, I'll be here every day moving forward. And uh, let's take a look at the numbers. I'm, I'm confident that uh, we're going to go in the right direction. On your second question about uh, cottage country, I just uh, had a, 
a message from uh, Norm Miller, uh, representative up in uh, the Muskoka area, uh, specifically Huntsville, Bracebridge, along with many, many mayors and many, many wardens I've talked to. They're, they're begging us to get the message out, please, this long weekend, do not go to your cottage. Uh, we can't stress it enough. And, and, you know, there's no one, Travis, that loves the cottage more than I do, but I'm not going to my cottage. Uh, we're we're going to make sure that we listen uh, to the, the uh, protocol that the chief medical officer has, has requested. And especially the people up there, they, you know how nice the people are and so salt of the earth up in cottage country. But they have to take care of their, their families and, and the health crisis, you know. They, they don't have as many uh, acute care beds as we do here in large urban centers. And when, uh, you know, 50,000, 100,000 people start heading up north, they'll clean the shelves off in the grocery uh, stores. And we all know the lineups are long, long enough right now. Uh, we don't want to put that burden on, on people up uh, in the cottage country. So please just stay at home. Next question. Next question comes from Allison Jones of the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, Premier. Um, still on testing. Uh, you've said that, you know, at first the issue was that there weren't enough assessment centers. Um, then we had to ramp up lab capacity and there wasn't enough reagent. Yep. What's your understanding based on the, the discussions you've had with the people in the health system of what the issue still was? Because those problems have been solved uh, is yep. my understanding for for a little while now what what is your understanding of why we were still having this issue of such a large testing gap well just really over the last probably four or five days we're able to restock the reagent uh, but it, but again Allison uh, we could sit here and I could give you a list all, all day long what I what I hear from uh, our, our team but uh, we have to move forward uh, we have to move forward and, and uh, learn from our mistakes in the past. And uh, again, I, I rely and I'll continue to rely on our on our experts on the health uh, table. But uh, I understand, and Allison, you understand, and every Ontarian understands. They understand numbers. They understand when they read in the newspaper that South Korea, uh, you know, slowed the spread and uh, flattened the curve by doing one thing. I'm sure. And we are taking you live now to Toronto. The Ministers of Finance, Small Business and Science and Industry are speaking now. They're providing more information about the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. Let's listen. ...to disruption to our economy, that people have money for the essentials. Depuis le début de la crise de COVID-19, notre priorité... Our priority has been people. We are protecting people's health and ensuring they have access to the care they need. And in spite of this unprecedented uh, disturbance in our economy, we want to be sure people have enough money to buy essential goods. People who've made sacrifices to stay at home, and also the many businesses that have temporarily shut down to protect us all from the spread of COVID-19. I know that's not been easy. But nothing's more valuable than our health. As we've said from the very beginning, we will use all tools that we have to help Canadians get through this. We introduced the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. I think you may have heard that applications opened on Monday, and millions of Canadians have now applied. We announced the Canada Emergency Business Account, which will provide small businesses and nonprofits with interest free loans of up to $40,000. And 25% of this loan will be forgivable, up to $10,000, if it's paid back by December 31st, 2022. Today we're announcing that applications will begin to be available for this loan starting tomorrow. Loans will be available through large and small banks, as well as through credit unions as the program unfolds. Please reach out to your financial institution over the phone or online for more details on their application process. We announced uh, the Canada Emergency Business Account that will grant uh, small businesses and uh, charities loans of up to $40,000. 25% of that loan will be forgivable 
up to $10,000 if the loan is repaid before December 31st, 2022. Today, we are announcing that the application process for businesses will start to be available tomorrow. Loans will be available through both large and small banks, as well as credit unions. Contact your financial institution by phone or online for more details uh, on the application process. Last week, we announced the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, which will provide a 75% wage subsidy to employers that have been significantly impacted by COVID-19. It will be retroactive to March 15th and provide up to $847 per week per employee. Throughout this, I've been in constant communication with businesses across Canada. Last week, we announced the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, which will provide a wage subsidy of up to 75 percent to employers who have been significantly affected by COVID-19. It will be retroactive to March the 15th and will provide up to $847 per week per employee. I have been in constant communication with businesses right across Canada. Our government understands that we need to protect our economy, and thus we have to take measures to protect Canadian jobs. It would apply to employers in all sectors, except in the public sector. Businesses, big and small, charities and nonprofits that are significantly impacted by COVID-19 can apply for help to keep their employees. The eligibility criteria we announced last week that it would be available for employers who saw a 30% decline compared to the same month last year, allowed us to capture a broad swath of affected employers and give Canadians much needed confidence that their jobs are safe. But we also recognize that not all businesses are alike and not all jobs are alike. New businesses and startups might not have a year's worth of earnings to look back on. A high growth company that's created good jobs in the past year might not show significant decline since last year, but its growth may be significantly off track as a result of COVID-19, jeopardizing its ability to keep its workers. A shop that might have been doing swift business until mid-March, at which point people across Canada quickly reoriented, reoriented their lives, staying at home to stop the spread of the virus, may have a difficult time. Nonprofits and charities are seeing the needs for their services go up, but donations, in many cases, are going down. Today, we're announcing the proposed new details in order to address the realities, these realities, of different businesses and organizations. Our goal is clear. We want to make sure that employers that have been significantly impacted by COVID-19 get the help they need to support their workers through this crisis. First, given that the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis were still evolving during the first half of March 2020, we're proposing that for March, the revenue test will be 15%. In other words, businesses will need to show that during that period, the revenue went down by 15%. For April and May, the revenue test will continue to be at 30%. Employers will have to apply for each month and attest to the drop each month. We're also proposing two possible benchmarks for employers. They'll be able to compare revenues to their revenues last year or, alternatively, they can use an average of revenues in January and February of this year and compare March, April and May revenues to that same average. Employers would calculate revenues through one of two accounting methods, either the accrual method or the cash method. Today, we are announcing new details with respect to the wage subsidy so that it will meet the realities of different types of businesses. First of all, since the economic impacts of the COVID-19 crisis uh, evolved during the first half uh, of March 2020, we are proposing that uh, the uh, revenue test be 15 percent for that month. For April and May, the revenue test will still be a 30 percent decline. We are also proposing two benchmarks for employers. They can compare their revenue with the same month last year, or they can use an average of revenues for January and February 
February of this year and compare them with March, April, and May. Employers will be able to calculate their revenue based on two accounting methods, either the accrual method or the cash method. By offering these different methods of calculating revenues, more employers and employees will get the help that they need. We know that times are tough, but we're encouraging employers to do all that they can to top up their, salary, their employees' pay to 100 percent of pre-crisis pay levels. We all need to do our part to help each other through this challenge. And in order to make it simpler and cost-effective for employers to rehire workers, the government is propo proposing to refund employer contributions to Employment Insurance, the Canada Pension Plan, the Quebec Parental Insurance Plan, and the Quebec Pen Pension Plan as well. We're also proposing flexibility for nonprofits and charities because we recognize that those organizations are each fa fa facing their own funding pressures at this time. And so we're proposing that when charities and nonprofits are calculating their revenue tests, they be allowed to choose whether or not to include government funding in that test. And in order to make uh, the rehiring of employees easier for employers, the government is proposing to refund uh, employer contributions to the CPP, the uh, Parental Plan in Quebec, the QPP, and EI. And we are proposing to be flexible with nonprofit organizations and charities when we see that you are facing funding challenges now. And that's why we are proposing that when charities and nonprofits calculate their revenue to determine whether they're eligible or not to the program, they be authorized to choose uh, to include or not include government funding. Honest and responsible people who look after each other and play by the rules. However, we're making sure that anybody who tries to skirt the rules faces significant consequences. To begin with, applicants will have to designate someone with control over their finances to, to uh, make sure that their claims are appropriate. Any business that receives the benefit and is discovered to be ineligible will have to repay the full amount. Anyone caught abusing the program could face penalties up to 225 percent of what they've received and up to five years in prison. This is a high trust program, but we will not tolerate abuses. We want to ensure that uh, people who try to skirt uh, the rules understand that they will uh, be punished. We are talking about uh, penalties of up to 225 percent of the money received and up to five years in prison. Let us make sure that we do not let down the workers who are counting on us to support them. As we navigate these uncertain times, our government will continue listening to the very real needs of Canadians. In the face of an historic public health crisis, we're providing historic support. These are the largest economic measures of our lifetime. Now's the time for everyone to come together and to work together. Businesses who are rehiring their workers, but also parliamentarians. Canadians are counting on us during these times. We cannot let them down. Our government will continue to do whatever it takes to support the workers and the businesses that make our economy strong. We'll do this because we know that when this crisis passes, and it will pass, that Canada's economy will bounce back quickly and we'll be able to keep building an even better Canada. Thank you very much. And now I'll pass it to my colleague, Mary Ng, Minister of Small Businesses and International Trade. Thank you so very much, uh, Minister Morneau, Bill. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I've spent the last week since our original wage subsidy announcement talking to businesses of all sizes, large and small. I've been on calls, video conferences, live Q&As to reach thousands of businesses and associations to answer their questions and to address their concerns. And I will continue to do that each and every day as we go through this together. And that's my commitment to you. What I've learned from these interactions has helped to inform the improvements that we have made to the wage subsidy in just a week's time. Your ideas, your concerns, your feedback have had a direct line to me and our government. Because when we say we're in this together, we mean it. 
The changes we have outlined today will mean more flexibility and support for new businesses, high growth companies, startups, and not for profits. I want to be clear on this. We're moving in real time. Our job is to support you as fast as we possibly can, but our job isn't done until those supports are meeting your needs. I'm paying particular attention to Canada's small businesses in this country, the backbone of our economy, and the very heart of our communities, from the corner store to the local restaurant to the tech startup or the small manufacturing company and so many more. We know that things are extremely tough right now for you and for your employees. We want you to know that every aspect of this wage subsidy has been designed to preserve jobs, to keep businesses afloat, and help you prime for recovery. Part of this effort is to help you keep your team in place because we agree that you can gain more ground more quickly and be more successful if you have preserved your team throughout this ordeal, readying you for time of recovery when that con comes. The wage subsidy is in place to directly assist you with this challenge. So let me end with an earnest message to Canadian business owners. Thank you. I know this is hard, but we really have your back. Keep pushing us. Keep telling us what works, what doesn't work. We're in a brand new world. It's difficult and I know it's complex. I hear it from you. I, I hear that it's frustrating. But if we keep talking and we keep working together to find these solutions, we're going to weather this storm and we will come out of this the other side together. Over to my colleague, Minister Navdeep Baines. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Minister Ng, and thank you very much, uh, Minister Marno. I, I too want to echo uh, my thanks uh, to the business community, to industry. Uh, in particular, I want to thank them for stepping up in a big way once again for our mobilization efforts, first and foremost, and really helping us uh, make the essential equipment that we need, uh, the personal protective equipment that we need for frontline health care workers and to protect uh, them against the fight uh, for COVID-19. I also want to echo the comments that my colleagues made with respects to businesses. We hear you. Uh, we're listening. Uh, we have our ears to the ground. We're engaged on this file. We're seized with this issue. And we're making changes to assist you and to help you. And today's announcement uh, underscores our commitment to high growth firms as well. This has been a commitment of our government since 2015. When we advanced our innovation and skills plan, it was designed with the purpose to help Canadian companies scale and grow and succeed, not only within Canada, but globally as well. We've invested in talent and in capital, and we're going to redouble our efforts as we navigate ourselves through this crisis and come out the other side and start to see the recovery. I can tell you right now, we continue to have your backs, and this is important because this is about jobs. This is about Canadians. This wage subsidy underscores and highlights the importance of retaining jobs. It's about steady income, and it's about confidence. Confidence in the economy, and confidence that we will recover. I can tell you right now that we are in this together and we will get through this together. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we will be taking questions from the journalists. Please limit your uh, interactions to one question and one follow-up. Moderator, c'est à have a question, there will be a brief pause while the participants register for questions. Thank you for your patience. And the first question is from David Youngren from Reuters News Ottawa. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Minister. First off, the expansion of the requirement that businesses only have to show a 15% drop rather than a 30% drop revenue in March. Do you have a direct spending figure in dollars for that? Extra direct spending? So uh, thanks, David. Uh, what we what we did last week, of course, was to uh, bring out the program and give a broad understanding of what the costs were. Uh, our estimate uh, was at that time $71 billion, an enormous uh, expenditure on behalf of Canadians. What we've seen is with the changes we've made, we expect it to be about $73 
a billion dollars, and that's primarily driven by the fact that we've allowed employers to bring people back, and we said that we will reimburse them on uh, employment insurance or Canada Pension Plan or Quebec Pension Plan. That's actually driving some, some change for those employees that come back but aren't actively working. The, uh, the decision to uh, allow for a 15 percent decline in revenues in March to March was really driven by the fact that we see that that's uh, really this COVID-19 hit in the middle of March, so it didn't fundamentally change our calculations. And secondly, in oil producing provinces, if I'm a company that's seen my revenues go through the floor because of low oil, am I still able to claim this or do I have to prove it's directly related to something to do with COVID? For the uh, for companies in Canada that have experienced the revenue declines that we're outlining, uh, that uh, that significant decline, they will be eligible. So, for those uh, employers in the energy sector that are seeing big declines, both as a result of COVID-19 and uh, the OPEC decisions, uh, they will be eligible for this, and it will provide significant support for those organizations, like it will for organizations across the country. Thanks. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. The next question is from Laura McNaughton from CBC News. Please go ahead. Oh, hi there. Yes, this question is for Minister Morneau. Uh, Air Canada, they announced today that they'll be using money from the federal wage subsidy program to hire back 16,500 laid off workers. I'm wondering what your reaction is to Air Canada hiring back these employees, and is this what the wage subsidy program is intended to be used for, to help large corporations like Air Canada? Uh, I was very encouraged to see Air Canada's decision. This is exactly what we're trying to do. For businesses, large and small, we're trying to make sure that they retain their, their uh, attachment with their employees. So Air Canada bringing back those employees is, is critically important for their business, I know. It's critically important for thousands of people. And it's in that context that I want to say we, we really need the other parties in, in Parliament to move forward and support this. We've had uh, both uh, constructive comments and support from the Bloc Québécois, but for the other parties that have said that we, we need to get money to businesses so they can subsidize those employees quickly, we need them to support us and to get it done quickly so that we can actually deliver the funds required. It's critically important. I, I, can't, I can't say how urgent it is because there's tens of thousands of employees like these employees at Air Canada that are counting on us so that they can be attached to their employer and so that they can get up to that $847 per week through their employer's wage subsidy. Do you have a follow-up? No? Okay, good. Thank you. The next question is from Hélène Bouzetti from Le Devoir. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Morneau. I wanted to continue in that vein. I know there are negotiations with the opposition parties that seem to have come to a standstill because of demands being made by the Conservatives, and now apparently the NDP is also posing problems. So we continue to have discussions with the other parties. The important thing for me, we haven't had any questions about our wage subsidy. For example, we proposed that there be greater accountability with a virtual parliament. That's very important. So in my opinion, it's urgent. It is urgent to reach an agreement. It is urgent to implement uh, this policy for people right across Canada. And I do hope that the other parties will reconsider their position so that we can expedite the process. You didn't really answer my question. The Conservative Party and the NDP, are they posing problems right now? Are they the ones in insisting, or are they the reason why the return to the House of Commons has not happened yet? Well, what I can say is that we've had significant discussions with all the parties. 
We have received constructive discussions uh, from the bloc in terms of their support, and we remain in discussion with the other parties at this time. And it is important that we reach an agreement as soon as possible. That is important for companies and especially for people right across the country who want to benefit from that wage subsidy as quickly as possible. That's very important, and that's why we have to continue these discussions, but they have to come to an end. Next question. Thank you. The next question is from Raymond Filion from TVA. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Morneau. In the same vein, we don't know when the House of Commons will sit in order to approve the subsidy. Do you think that this uh, delay could uh, also delay the implementation of the new program? Yes, there's always that risk, and that's precisely why we need to reach an agreement as soon as possible. In our opinion, we need to get the wage subsidy implemented as soon as possible possible for those businesses uh, who are waiting for this legislation to pass. But it's very important to consider what we're doing. We made a decision that an employee can receive 75 percent of their income up to $847 a week. That's very important for them, and that's why we have to reach an agreement. And if it takes more time to do that, it will be more difficult for people and, of course, more difficult for companies to access the subsidy. So it's urgent. Now, you're saying the subsidy will come into effect in two or three weeks. So in order for that to happen, when does Parliament have to approve, approve the program? It's urgent. We need there to be an agreement as soon as possible. I can't give you an exact date, but right now, every company is reviewing its position. And if there is no certainty, it's quite possible that they may make a different decision. And that's why we need to get this agreement in place. And that way, companies will make the decision to keep and protect their employees and protect the possibility of giving them $847 a week. That's why it's urgent, and that's why we need to reach an agreement with the other parties in Parliament, and I hope that they will uh, reconsider their position as soon as possible. The next question is from Lena Dib from La Presse Canadienne. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Morneau. I'm trying to understand if we're only going from 71 billion to 73 billion with this uh, change, uh, even though you're reimbursing contributions to EI and so on. Uh, and lowering the income level to 15 percent. Now, uh, were there companies last week that were already prepared to rehire their employees or? Well, as I said, last week we announced the program and the approach taken led us to believe the cost would be $71 billion, but with the, the improvements to the program based on the advice of companies and associations in the last week to make it easier for companies. Uh, for example, companies with a high growth or nonprofits or charities, now we can be more precise with the cost. $73 billion is the cost, and it's a very important program in order to protect people. And the $73 billion will be going to people, to employees across the country. And that's why it's urgent. I know that people have a high level of anxiety at this 
this time because of their circumstances, and we need to get the subsidy in as possible, uh, as soon as possible, to help them. My question is, did you not have any takers for the first version of this, which was actually the second version of this? Did you not have any enough enough companies interested, and that's why you changed the criteria? Uh, not at all. What we've done is we've made sure that the criteria are such that for those companies that said this wouldn't quite fit me, we make sure that it fits them. So in, in a huge majority, the program was already capturing any employer who had been uh, experiencing a significant reduction in their revenues because of COVID-19. And this is just making sure that we capture you know, those high growth companies, the, uh, the not-for-profits that have revenue coming from government or companies that maybe experience revenue declines just starting in the middle of March because that's when the, the, uh, the closures started happening most significantly. So, so we think that like with all of the programs we're putting in place, we need to be dynamic. We need to recognize that as this challenge is confronting Canadians, our policies also need to confront this challenge. And each week we're thinking about how we can ensure that we do do that in a way that gives people confidence that they can face up to this, confidence that they'll be able to get out of this challenge uh, with themselves and their families intact. And just very quickly on that, just to build on what uh, Minister Marneau said, the additions and the changes that uh, we identified today really reflect high growth firms as well. We as a government have been focusing on helping companies scale and grow. And we recognize there's companies that have demonstrated 20% growth year over year for three years in a row, both growth in terms of their revenues and also growth in terms of their employees that may not necessarily have been eligible under the previous criteria. So this is more expensive. This is designed to do more, not less, help more businesses, not less. We have thousands and thousands of high growth firms across the country that will benefit from these changes. And that's the objective that we wanted to communicate today, is to say not that this program was not generous, but we're making it even more expansive and more helpful to Canadians right across the country, particularly focusing on high growth firms. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. The next question is from David Aiken from Global News. Please go ahead. Minister, you there? Just want to make sure I'm unmuted. There we go. Whoop, I want to take off that too. Um, Minister, thank you very much for the question. I just want to switch topics a little bit to talk about savings. Um, Canada is not necessarily a, a great nation of savers, and that's been the way it is for a while. But I wonder if you've considered letting Canadians withdraw some savings from, say, a RRSP or a TIFSA or I'm not sure what, um, without getting taxed. In other words, say get a lump sum of take $2,000 out of your RSP without getting taxed. Has there been any uh, consideration to allowing Canadians to tap into savings and, and be forgiven the tax on it? Well, uh, thank you, David, for the question. Uh, our approach has been to consider all potential ways that we can support Canadians during this time. You've seen that we've been extraordinarily expansive. We've, we've now announced measures that are going to directly support Canadians of about $107 billion, as well as tax deferrals that are another $85 billion or so. These are the largest single decisions that have been taken since World War II. Uh, we're looking at all ways that we can do things that are directly putting money back into people's pockets. Some of the things that we've done are uh, in line with what you just asked, allowing seniors to uh, not have to take as much money out in the registered retirement income fund, recognizing the decline in the stock market. Uh, so we're going to keep thinking about how we can support people. The measures that you talked about are not things that are currently on our agenda, but obviously uh, we've made enormous uh, decisions to support people directly, and we're looking forward to getting these policies out. Uh, you've seen that now millions, I think we've passed three million people have taken up the Canada Emergency Response Benefit this week. Uh, I think you're going to see uh, firms, you heard that Air Canada is deciding to use this wage subsidy. You're going to see firms do that uh, very rapidly once we get Parliament to approve this in a way that gives them confidence. And that means we'll be supporting literally millions upon millions of Canadians with programs so that they can get through this challenge and have enough money for their essentials. Maybe just to think a bit more broadly and thinking a bit further down the road once we start to get into a recovery. Um, 
governments, your government and lots of previous governments have often struggled with the idea that Canadians have not necessarily been savers. And of course, the low interest rate environment we've had for the last you know, decade or so has not exactly been great to encourage people to save. And I wonder whether or not it would be a priority coming out of this to implement more policies to encourage Canadians to save, or given that consumer spending is such a driver of economic growth, it will be important for the federal government to encourage Canadians to spend. I wonder if you have some thoughts, again, where we're, we're going once we start to see curves move in the right direction. We do need to think uh, both about dealing with the urgent and important issues today and about how we get out of this. And we are starting to think about how we, we build ourselves back to an economy that's uh, seeing uh, strength, that's going to support uh, employment. Um, but right now, we're not at a, a stage where we're talking about the policies that we might be doing in order to ensure that that happens. We're very much focused on how we protect people getting through this crisis and ensure that the policies that we have are focused on people, but also on this time, so that we can both get people out of this challenge and also allow these policies to be uh, reduced as we get out of it in a way that will support our economic growth. So no decisions on, on next steps yet but a continuing focus on how we deal with those people that are, are challenged, and we will continue, as you've heard the Prime Minister say, to deal with the gaps, the challenges that are presenting themselves, so that we, we really can ensure that anybody impacted by this uh, has the support they need to get through it. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from Kate Elongaro from Bloomberg. Please go ahead. Hello, Minister Morneau. Um, I have a question regarding um, the uh, Canada's credit rating. I'm wondering if you're concerned about Canada's credit rating, if it's in danger at all, given the rising debts due to the unprecedented spending. Well, thank you. Uh, the good news from uh, the standpoint of, uh, of Canada from the government finances is we started off in a, in a very, very strong position. Our debt as a function of our economy is uh, not only the lowest among G7 countries, but, but the less than half of the average. So uh, we're going to keep watching that, of course. We're going to keep uh, ensuring that we, we make the decisions that will allow us to get out of this. Our view is that we need to make these investments. We need to protect people because that's what's going to allow us to get out of this, this economic challenge and allow us to start up again in a way that ensures that we have a strong economy. That's the most fundamental thing that, uh, that we all care about and also that credit agencies will care about. The strength of the economy, our ability to carry the additional debts that we will have put on in order to support ourselves during this time. And I'm very confident, uh, given the, the starting point that we have, given the, the cost of, of debt right now, and given our ability to get our economy back up and going, that we will continue to be seen as a very, very strong uh, government and uh, continue to have those strong credit ratings that enable us to, uh, to raise capital when required to support Canadians. And have you received any feedback from credit rating companies in that regard? Uh, no, we haven't. That's, this is really a time where we're, we're very focused on making the decisions that are appropriate for our economy, but really appropriate for, for Canadians. And uh, all of our time, uh, and literally all of our time, has been spent on making sure that these policies, like the wage subsidy that we're talking about today, like the emergency response benefit, like the loans for businesses, are tailored and targeted correctly. Uh, it's really not a time where we're spending um, spending our efforts in uh, in talking to international credit rating agencies. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. The next question is from Adam Langenberg from The Wire Report. Please go ahead. Hi. My question is for Minister Baines. Uh, have you been keeping an eye on how Canada's, uh, Canada's telecommunication networks are uh, performing during this period? And what's been your um, response so far? Well, uh, we're in a regular contact with the telecommunication companies. I speak on a regular basis with uh, the CEOs of these companies to understand uh, their current challenges and going forward, what are some of the issues that they may have. Uh, clearly, network capacity is something that has been a challenge, uh, but I'm very proud of the fact that we have some of the best networks uh, in the world, and we're seeing that on full display right now where people are working from home, 
where students are doing their homework online, where people are on Netflix and the networks are able to maintain uh, those sudden spikes uh, in network usage. Uh, my understanding is for home internet usage, for example, uh, weekly, week over week increase, increases sometimes are as high as 60 percent. So uh, we've got strong, robust networks, and, but I'm in constant contact with the telecommunication companies to understand if there's any immediate challenges or needs. Um, but so far, so good. Uh, but I do also want to acknowledge the field workers and the front lines uh, that are maintaining these networks. Uh, they're essential for the fact that we're able to communicate with one another. And I want to thank uh, those workers that are doing so much day in and day out uh, to make sure that we're able to communicate with uh, each other, with our families and loved ones. question is from Emily Bergeron from Agence QME. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. My question is for Mr. Morneau. Coming back to your negotiations with the opposition parties for a return of parliament on an urgent basis, as you said, you mentioned that you propose that parliament sit uh, in virtual mode uh, perhaps for a question period. Was that proposal rejected by them? I can't say whether it was accepted or rejected. What I want to say is that we think it's very important to be accessible. We believe that our approach and transparency are very important, and we also know that we need to be in Parliament uh, to consider the views of the other parties. That's why we considered how we might be able to do that, and a virtual Parliament is one option that could work, in our opinion. So for us, the important thing is the substance of our approach uh, with the wage subsidy. It will improve the situation of tens of thousands of people right across this country, or even more. So it really is extremely urgent to get that policy in place, and that's why I'm saying that we must reach an agreement as soon as possible. Uh, just to be clear, uh, the disagreement uh, don't seem to be around the the salary wage, it seemed to be about other things. Is that correct? And what are the, the, the disagreements about? Well, what I can say is that we've had uh, uh, constructive comments and support from the Bloc Quebecois, and uh, we've, uh, we've not heard any uh, disagreements on the uh, substance of the wage subsidy. Uh, I think we all realize how important it is. And so from that standpoint, uh, we believe it's important to, to get back to work, to get this passed, so that we can have the kind of support that Canadians need. Uh, we've uh, ensured that we are accountable to other parties. So from my standpoint, it's time to get on with it. Merci. Prochaine question. Thank you. The next question is from Glenn McGregor from CTV News. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Minister Morneau. Um, I want to ask you about the credit card relief. Uh, you've got an agreement with uh, chartered banks to uh, cut rates for people who are struggling to make their payments. But what about sort of broader relief? Why was that not considered? We still have some of the very high credit card uh, interest rates. And also doesn't really do much to help people who don't qualify for credit cards who are relying on payday loan companies to, to uh, bridge their financing from month to month. Uh, are there any further discussions about uh, uh, mandating greater cuts to borrowing rates for average Canadians? We've, uh, we've been working together over the last number of weeks with the banks to make sure that the banks are supporting their customers, that they're supporting Canadians. We've also, as I mentioned, uh, come to an agreement and they'll be starting to uh, have the uh, small business loans, 25% of which will be forgivable 
if, uh, if small businesses pay those back before the end of 2022. That's going to be starting uh, tomorrow. These are really important uh, conclusions that can support literally hundreds of thousands, if not over a million small businesses. We've uh, also been pushing them to make sure that they support people who are in a challenging situation. So uh, deferring mortgages was important. We're seeing hundreds of thousands of mortgage deferrals. And dealing with credit card fees was also important for, for people that are, that are struggling. And so that was why, um, after these discussions, we were pleased to see them cut the rates in half for people who are struggling, and that, that is critically important. Our role as government, though, will be to support everyone, and that's what we've done through the emergency response benefit and the wage subsidy, making sure that those people who are directly impacted have support. We'll continue to do that. We'll work with the banks, and we'll work with whoever we need to work with to make sure that Canadians can get through this. Mr. Bain, good news today, obviously, about Air Canada hiring back 16,000 employees, but the industry as a whole in Canada is still really struggling. Can you tell me where we are on an aid package specific to the airline industry. So to echo the comments made by uh, Minister Marno, it's uh, great news to see the fact that Air Canada has retained these employees. That was the exact intent of the wage subsidy. It's designed to make sure people have income, that companies can keep people on their payroll, and ultimately this is important as we come through the recovery. So when we're talking about supporting industries and supporting companies, one way to do that is to make sure we have this wage subsidy implemented, and that's why it's important that the other parties support us through this endeavor uh, and avoid the partisan politics and uh, allow us to implement this in a timely manner. But more broadly speaking, we know it's not only the airline industry, if you look at tourism, if you look at oil and gas, uh, if you look at the retail sector, they've been significantly uh, uh, challenged by the recent events. So we're going to have a holistic approach. Uh, our goal is to make sure that overall we have a plan in place, not only for the short term and immediate needs for Canadians and providing them with income, but also how can we quickly rebound and recover. And that includes support uh, for many sectors across the board. Uh, but more importantly, uh, right now our priority is Canadians. And then, of course, we will be putting forward sets of initiatives and ideas and plans to assist different industries, including the airline industry. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. The next question is from James Bradshaw from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Minister Morneau. Uh, my question is about the CBA Small Business Loan Program. I'm wondering how long will the turnaround time be to disperse those funds to businesses after they apply? Uh, we'd reported that the government had considered a five-day waiting period to do verification on the loans, but was working to shorten that wait to about two days. How long should businesses owners expect to wait uh, for those funds? Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm hopeful that those funds will, uh, will be able to be dispersed quite quickly. And uh, the good news is that we've, we've, uh, we're at a stage where we expect that the, the large banks in particular uh, will be able to start this approach uh, literally tomorrow. And that means that businesses will be able to go to the current uh, institution they work with, uh, banks, and we're also opening up to credit unions uh, in, the, uh, in the days and weeks to come. Uh, so that's, that's important, and then they will be able to get the money dispersed uh, once the bank goes through their, their appropriate uh, their processes. So uh, our hope is that that can be within about two days after that, uh, that initial uh, interaction. Um, but it will, it will, of course, have a little bit of variability depending on the, on the, on the company and on the institution, the financial institution they go to. The objective is to get money in people's hands as quickly as possible so they can deal with the challenges that they have if their business in particular is uh, significantly challenged because of um, declining revenues. Thank you. And, and just to follow up on that, as it expands, how broadly do you plan to draw the eligibility for the financial institutions that can offer loans through the SEPA program in terms of smaller banks and credit unions? And, and for a business that has their main account at a smaller financial institution that's not initially part of it, is there somewhere they can turn to apply? We're, we're working to expand it as broadly as possible to large and small financial institutions and across credit unions. Um, so that work is ongoing. It, it will be as expansive as we can, we can get it in those uh, discussions. Uh, to the extent that someone finds a challenge with, uh, with the institution that they're at, of course they will be able to go to another institution. Uh, but the main goal is to, is to make it broadly accessible across financial institutions so that the small businesses can get uh, rapid access to capital in a challenging time.
Thank you, and we will be taking one last question. Thank you. The last question is from Murad Hamadi from The Logic. Please go ahead. Uh, ministers uh, Murad uh, and Ben, uh, you said, <laughs> my apologies, you said repeatedly um, today that these changes will benefit uh, high growth uh, firms. Uh, can you uh, specify which changes, uh, which of the three changes specifically will benefit high growth firms? Because uh, we're already hearing from some that say uh, they still don't believe that they're going to qualify uh, based on the revenue requirements. Well, I'll take it quickly and then pass it over to, uh, to Navdeep. So uh, what we've uh, made as an important change is initially last week when we came out with this, we said that the test of a decline in revenue would be if their revenue in uh, the March 15th to uh, end of May period this year was 30 percent less than the similar period last year. And the challenge for that is that if a firm has grown significantly during the course of the last year but experienced a decline in the last couple of months, that they might still have revenue that's too high to be um, showing that they've been affected. So instead, what we've said is they just need to look at the revenue that they had in January and February of 2020, and if they can show those declines against that level of revenue, then they will be able to have access to this support. Uh, there will always be businesses who have not been as impacted by COVID-19 that won't, uh, won't be eligible. The, the plan was to make it so that we, we are capturing businesses who've had a significant revenue decline. We think that this significantly helps uh, those high growth companies or companies for which they might have been in a situation where 2019 revenues, for whatever reason, were significantly lower than 2020 revenues. But Navdeep, maybe, I don't know if you yeah, have no, a I think, Bill, uh, Minister Mono, you've captured it correctly. I mean, the fundamental goal is uh, we recognize when we initially designed the program, there were certain companies that were not eligible. Uh, the changes reflected by Minister Marno now capture more high growth firms, and that is a key priority for us because these firms uh, continue to uh, give us hope in terms of the ability to grow the economy after this crisis. Uh, we have been focused on high growth firms from day one. We recognize that they're essential both in terms of their ability to attract talent, retain talent, and also uh, create more opportunities for Canadians as well. So as you can see from the costing today as well, the initial costing was around $71 billion for this wage subsidy program. After these changes, it's more generous uh, and will help more companies, high growth companies, and that's where the costing is approximately $73 billion. And so this is a clear signal uh, to companies uh, that uh, they can engage with us and CRA to see if they meet the requirements. Of course, each company has a unique set of circumstances, but we've made the program more expensive. Uh, the Logic has obtained a draft copy of this legislation, and the January and February 2020 uh, uh, revenue comparison criteria is limited to firms that were not carrying out business on March 1st, 2019. So those are firms that are less than a year old. That is not all high growth firms. Uh, can you please clarify whether that January and February 2020 uh, benchmark will apply to all firms or just firms that were not in business on March 1st, 2019? Maybe I'll. Yeah, so uh, Minister Marno would speak to that. So to be clear, firms will have a choice. They will be able to show the revenue decline versus where they were last year at this time, or they'll be able to compare their revenue to the revenue in January and February 2020. So they will have a choice. They're not excluded based on when they started or they're not excluded on any other basis. They're, they're able to choose the, uh, the place uh, that, uh, that is more appropriate for their situation. So I'd like to thank everyone for being with us today. We're going to continue to work on behalf of Canadians to support them through a challenging time. Je voudrais dire merci à tout le monde. Nous, and nous you've been listening to uh, de, Finance de... Minister Bill Morneau as well as Navdeep Baines and, uh, and other ministers talking today about the emergency wage subsidy that the federal government is offering. We also heard from the Prime Minister earlier on this where the federal government has announced that it is loosening some of the criteria around who will be eligible for 
uh, this wage subsidy, Air Canada announcing that they are going to use this wage subsidy to retain 16,000 employees. As you know, Air Canada, uh, one of the larger firms, but and this applies to large firms and small firms, but one of the larger firms that has been hit hard by this uh, global pandemic. We're going to Halifax now. Nova Scotia officials are providing an update on COVID-19. The province is reporting 30 new cases today.